I 100% did not expect to wake up seven o'clock that morning and find I was facing 35 years. Don't, all you people like in the sun and the mail and you're like, oh, being in prison is a bloody piece of cake. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It is the last thing it is. It's horrible. But some sex offenders don't want to be in those units because it's a night being there is horrible, right? It's just, it's with horrible people, horrible places, and they don't want to do it. So they try to go undercover in the general population. He was notorious for dragging them into his cell and beating the living daylights out of them. Everyone knew it happened, the cops didn't care. I met him, arranged to meet him one night, and I took a gun with me, and as soon as I saw him, I just took the gun out and popped him. I'm like, what, just like that? He said, yeah, just like that. There was a very, very well-known Russian mob guy in our prison, right? And he was a he, he was a fearsome character, right? He'd been shot a few times. I subsequently Googled him and he's a very, very le a lethal prisoner. Next thing I know, a Russian guy stood right by me with his knee right by my head, right? Derby, yeah, get up. And I'm like, right. And Andre was even the diplomat. I go, yeah. He goes, what did you say to that mob guy last night? Who can say they met a mob boss and, mm. and had a decent chat with him, right? The world is racing to get back to normal. We all want to meet up again. But after a year of being locked down, it takes time to get back to normal. When we are going through things, we tend to turn to our friends to talk to, but they don't necessarily give us the best advice. We all need help from time to time, and asking for support is a sign of strength. It is not weak. Help is available immediately through Talkspace, who will match your needs with a licensed professional. You could get the help right away. Start feeling better with a single message. Match with a licensed therapist when you go to Talkspace.com and you will get $100 off your first month if you use the promo code SEAN, S-H-A-U-N. That's $100 off when you use the promo code SEAN at Talkspace.com. Hello, welcome to our latest True Crime podcast. Many of our people who've been in the American prison system stories have got massive feedback, comments, people are asking, get more people who've been on in the American prison system. And Giles Darby has a hell of a story for you. You may have seen him in the news. It was like the NatWest 3, the Enron 3. But to give him his due, I've researched this case and it definitely looks like he was set up as a fall guy, because this fraud was so devastatingly big on the American public. If you look at the Enron fraud in total, it was a, a record breaker at the time, 50 billion pounds. It's like 60, 70 million um, billion dollars. And this had the link to the highest levels of the US government. Kenneth Lay was George Bush Jr.'s biggest financial contributor at one point, flying around in the jets and all this stuff. And I said, I was incarcerated in Arizona when all this went down. And I turned to my cellmate and I said, Kenneth Lay will never get to speak at trial. <laughs> <laughs> and then, right, yeah. and then yeah. he died. <laughs> he died. <laughs> he died. So we're going to get to the, more about the backstory towards the end, but we're going to start out in the thick of the action today with this one, whereby Giles is going into the US prison system. And because he's an older fellow, because he's well-spoken, he's got a good education, he's concerned that he may be targeted. And he, so he, he has to put it out there that, you know, the nature of his crimes. And also I'd like to thank everybody 
who has supported. Jen's first podcast was with Tug of War. We got massive positive feedback on that. Jen, if you're not familiar with her, she's a local person here in Surrey, and she runs a organic cotton clothing company. And the links for her Insta and her website will be in the description box below the video. All right, so over to Giles then. So yeah, I mean, I mean, looking at you right now, I mean, when I go in to the Arizona State system, all these guys have got swastikas and lightning bolts, and they're all coming up to me, flames, skull on the tattooed on their skulls, and they're coming up to me like, you know, what are your charges, kind of thing. So how did you get through your charge check? Okay, so I mean, obviously, it's petrifying when you go in. You you, you have no idea what to expect, other than you know it's going to be bloody awful, right? You know that straight away, right? There's nothing good about what's about to happen. And so um, you, you walk in. I was in solitary to begin with, which most people that go into this system get put in solitary to begin with because it teaches you how actually horrible it is to be in solitary. And the way they control prisoners is because if you do something wrong, you're going straight back to solitary. So everybody starts in solitary. So I started in solitary. After four or five days, you get released in the general population. And the problem, the issue that I could per I perceived is that um, where I was in Allenwood FCI medium is that um, there was about 40% were, were Afro-Americans, about 40% were Latinos, Colombians, Mexicans and stuff, about 20% white guys. Wow, so you really were the minority. Yeah, and of that 20% white guys, there's a lot of mob who are out in Allenwood. And the reason for that is that in the system over there, you'll know this, it's actually quite funny what they do. Um, they they are required by law to keep you within 500 miles of your hometown. All right. Now, Allenwood, Pennsylvania is about 500 miles from New Jersey, right? <laughs> so, so Allenwood, Pennsylvania, unsurprisingly, is full of mob because it makes it difficult for their people mm. to get there to see them, right? It, it, you're supposed to be able to get there and, there and back in a day. So 500 miles there and back in a day, you know, unlikely, right? But that's what they do. Anyway, so there's a lot of mob there as well. But so yeah, I'm an older white guy, and as things stand, you know, you're an obvious target for the the guys that don't like the paedophiles because you're you're obviously a suspect paedophile. So I I arrive, I get I get into my cell, and I I never know if they did this del deliberately, but what they did was if it was deliberate, it was quite good of them to do it. I was put inside a cell with two elder black fellows, okay? And one of them was the black leader of the wing. So I walk into his cell and he's like, looks at me, fucking who are you, right? What, <laughs> what on earth are you doing in here? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, uh, I was told to come into this cell. <laughs> it, it, who are you? Uh, my name. It's your first intimidating moment. For, so, like <laughs> looking at this guy, he's a hardened criminal. He's been inside for maybe 15, 17 years, right? He's like, he knows the ropes. You're right, okay, Derby. Yeah, okay, Derby, what you done? What are you in here for? Uh, I robbed a bank, right? You robbed a bank? What? Which bank? Uh, Nat West. Nat, he was boss Nat West. And I have to go through the whole story about <laughs> we're in for robbing a bank. You can't tell him, no, it's fraud. You know, it was wire fraud. It's complicated wire fraud stuff. They forget, they're not interested. You robbed a bank, right? At some point, someone said to me, you drove the car, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, you just sort of go, oh, don't worry about that. Right? Anyway, so I, L, his name was L. He turned out to be an amazing, brilliant, brilliant guy who took great care of me over the period I was there. Right? We get, and we became firm friends, right? Anyway, so I, I say I'm robbed a bank, right? But at the same time, I go to dinner that night, the chow hall, it's called, go to dinner. And I get approached by elder white guys because you, like for like, these guys want to try and help you. And, you know, you come out, you, if you've got a toothbrush, you've got any toothpaste, do you need anything? Can we get you anything? Blah, blah, blah. So, you know, you go out to, to, to um, the recreation ground, you walk around, you're just trying to sort of get your bearings, figure out what's going on couple of them come up chat how are you nice to meet you what you're doing and to be honest with you sean to begin with you're just grateful for someone to be nice to you right? you just think oh thank god i think it, maybe it's not the nightmare i thought it was going to be the, these guys are being pleasant to me blah 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 okay a couple of weeks go by 
and I get to meet quite a few people and, you know, you meet guys at lunchtime, go and walk around the rec yard, what have you. And um, just apropos of nothing, a couple of weeks later, I'm just stood waiting to go um, to dinner and one of the mob guys comes up to me and I'd seen him on the basketball court a few times. He was, he was always out there training. He was, he was similar age to me and he just went, hey, uh, your name's Darby, right? And I said, yeah, yeah that's right, yeah. Wondering what is he going to say to me, right? He goes, uh, listen, everyone I speak to says you're a good guy. And let me tell you now, right? You're mixing with the wrong people. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? He goes, Darby, I'm telling you, you're mixing with some of the wrong people, okay? And I'm like, right, what do I do about it? He says, figure it out. You're a smart guy. Figure it out for yourself. All right, okay. So there I am now. I'm like, oh my God, right? Of all the people I've, chatted to and stuff and I, you know people being nice to me now now i'm suspicious of every single person that i admit that i'm talking to right so of course then i say to l back in the cell later that night i say to l man this has just happened he's like yeah darby he's right yeah that guy he spoke to you i know who he is he's a really good guy and people like you right and they're looking out for you okay and i'm telling you now you you do need to think very hard about who you're dealing with so that's my start sean you know but you know you've sat in all these places i've seen some of your stories <laughs> i'm sitting there thinking yeah I, I i know about that so what was the mix then of prisoners in there did they have like sex offenders did they have their own prisons or did some of them go undercover in gp okay so in the states the way they do it um the all the they have units wings that are for sex offenders that are compounds that are sectioned off so the general population has nothing to do with them, okay? I mean, the biggest, the worst thing if you're in the US prison system is if you're a sex offender of any kind, right? Um, but some sex offenders don't want to be in those units because it's a night being there is horrible, right? It's just It's with horrible people, horrible places, and they don't want to do it. So they try to go undercover in the general population. And the cops, you know, in the UK, they're called screws. Over there, they're called cops, right? So the cops collude with some of these people and they try to help them have undercover stories, right? So there's one guy, just as an example of what happens, um, there's one guy, I, I had a job in the prison laundry, and there was one guy, very nice, smart, erudite guy that had been a senior guy in the US Army, colonel. He'd been in, in Iraq, he had two tours of Iraq, right? And he would talk about it a lot and he'd been in Iraq and this and the other. And he was running the laundry unit. And um because he's look, he had a good education, right? Smart man. Anyway, I was friendly with him. And we would go walking at night around the compound, chatting about life, about things that go on, about the prison, gossiping about what goes on in prison, did who who did this, who did that, what they're all in for. And you know, and again, I don't know, maybe a month after I'd been in there, um, this this guy just literally out of nowhere approached me on the compound and he says, hey, you're a, you've been uh, you're, you're friends with Brian, right? Yeah, I was, yeah, what, from the laundry? Yeah, that's right. He go, the guy goes, yeah, he's in my wing. Um, he's from Boston. I'm like, yeah. He, and the guy goes, I'm from Boston. Uh, right, and what's the point? He goes, what's he told you he's in for then? And he says, I says, he's in for money laundering or so. He goes, no, man, he's not in for money laundering. He's in for for fiddling with little kids. No. And I, I'm like, no, surely not. No, well, Brian, he's like, uh, yeah, man. He's, I can see you're upset. I said, I was devastated, Sean. This is a guy who's been really nice to me, chatting, you know, befriended me. Totally normal. Apparently, Jen, totally normal, right? On yeah. the face of it. And you're like, I mean, your head is in a spin at that point. Fuck. Because, of course, what happens is if you identify with these characters, then the other prisoners identify you as one of them, right? Yeah. So you can't be involved with them. So so, uh, and where does that lead? Where it leads is, uh, I mean, I, I laugh, but at the time it was shocking stuff. There was a, there was a guy in, in our wing, his first name is Wayne. We can talk about him later as if you want to, but... <laughs> He was notorious for dragging them into his cell and beating the living daylights out of them. Everyone knew it happened. The cops didn't care. No. The cops collude. In fact, 
subsequently, the mob guy who told me, be careful you're dealing with, subsequently, I became quite good friends with him, right? And he subsequently told me that the cops tell some of the senior guys on the wing, by the way, that guy over there is what he did, right? And it gets out. The cops make sure that the other general population know about the people. And that's how it all, that's how it works. So what was Wayne's story then? Hmm. Okay, so um, I met Wayne um, as I was being shipped out. I knew about him from gossip in the prison, but I met him as we were being shipped out when I was being sent back to the United Kingdom. And we just sat in the um, in the in the cells waiting to be moved. And um, uh, I got given some milk, and I didn't want to drink it. I just turned around to the guy and I said, um, "Do you want this, mate?" And he goes, "He goes, um, uh, no, but hey, listen, you're Derby, right?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah." He goes, "Oh, a few guys chatted to me about you." He said, "Oh, I've heard you, you know, nice guy and blah blah blah." I said, "Oh, who are you?" He goes, "Oh, my name's Wayne." I'm like, what, Wayne? He went, he went, uh, yeah, Wayne. I'm like, oh my God, right? You're the guy that drags him paedophiles into his cell, right? He's like, <laughs> he's like, tasty. he's like, yeah. He said, uh, yeah, that's me. Yeah. I'm like, seriously? I said, God, don't you care? Why do you do that? He goes, I don't care. I just, I, he said, I've gone beyond caring. What, why? What are you doing? Oh, man, I'm doing life. He said, but, you know, it's a 72 year minimum. I'm doing, I'm never coming out, right? So I don't care. Yeah. I actually don't care, right? I said, well, what's your story then? He said, well, he said, I got, I was wild and I was young and um, I decided I need, I, I got into a lot of trouble fighting and arguing with people and all sorts of GBH and stuff like that. So I joined the army, right? And I went into the army and I enjoyed it. I was, I, I need, well, I was someone needed to be controlled. I needed to have guidance in my life and, I was fine. I, I went away and exercises one time uh, and I had a girlfriend back at home um, and the exercises finished early and I went home to surprise her. And I walk in into the house where we are and um, all I can hear from upstairs is noises, right? So I go upstairs as a guy having sex with my girlfriend, right? I just completely and utterly went mad. I said, what did you do? He said, I just ran over to him, picked it, got him by the head. I smashed him in the face about 20 times and in the ribs as well. And uh, what happened is um, I broke one of his ribs and it um, went punctured. through his, yeah, it punctured his liver um, oh. and he died. I said, what did you do after that? He said, I went and sat on the sofa and waited for the red caps to come. I knew they would come. I just waited. And uh, I haven't seen the outside since. I'm Did like, you ask him what was man. going through his head while yeah, he was waiting? Pure, no, it, rage. Just yeah. pure crime of rage, right? Yeah. Crime of passion. Um, but because it was on um, US Army, uh, they wanted to sentence him to death. Yeah. So he went through the whole system of like facing the death penalty. Uh, and it was commuted and... The consequence of all of that is he was just hardened to the system. Yeah. And uh, the, the guy was just full of rage and anger, and he just wanted to take out on somebody, anybody. And unfortunately for anybody who was a sex offender that wandered by his cell, he, he, tar he knew, he targeted them. He would make sure he Became got them. a sport. <laughs> if you like, Jen, yeah, that's kind of... Look, 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 look. The thing about US prisons is that they are forlorn places, right? F they're, they're full of people that have no hope, no hope, right? The, the reoffending rate in the States is 75%, right? Yeah. Now, it's not because they go out to reoffend, it's because when they go out, the restrictions that are put on them are so severe. Yeah. They're so severe. So, probation require them to report probably two or three times a week. They have to report if who they've spoken to, who they might have met. This is while they're while you're on it's you know, it's on bond sort of thing. The worst one is they have to report any money they earn and what they do with it. So if they should actually go and get a job, yeah. They then have to say, I've got a job and I'm earning two hundred dollars a week and they have to report how they spent it. Now what that means is that if you're a black guy yeah. and you come out from prison well, you ain't going to get a job, number one. Mm -mm. 
So what do you do? You resort to the only way you know how to make money. You go back to crime. That's, all, that's what happens, right? So they might come out going, I'm going to go straight. I've just done 25 years, whatever you blah, blah, blah. I'm going to go straight. Like L, who was my celly, mm. he was swore blind. When he got out, he was done 17, 17 years, right? He, he went in when he was in his mid-20s, right? He swore blind to me. I'm going to, when I come out of Derby, I'm going to be, I'm going to go straight. I'm going to do all the right things. I'm not going to get back into trouble, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, when he got out, we stayed in touch via social media and we communicated and he phoned me up one day and he says, Hey man, can you lend me some money? Right. And this is like, well, we were out subsequently, no big deal. I could have lent him money. I said, oh, what do you want money for, man? Yeah, I got to do a few little deals. I got things I got to do. I said, you, what are you doing? You're going back to same ways. Yeah. Yeah, oh, man, I don't want to tell you about anything. I said, you are, aren't you? He said, yeah. I said, well, I'm not going to lend you money for that. If that's what you're going to do, I'm not going to lend you money. And then subsequently, he's back inside. It's like this set up for failure, isn't it? Because as soon as they go back inside, $60,000 a year of taxpayers' money to the prison system. So... You know, America's got to look at itself and its uh, mass incarceration policies are just out of control. Totally. Vested interests of the private prisons and all these other... Yeah. Well, anyway, let me get off my soapbox. That's all too uh, so social <laughs> stuff. <right? laughs> Let's go back to the mafia friend of yours then. What was his story? What was he in there for? Okay, well, in that case, uh, there's loads of mafia stories I could tell you, but the, Great. The, in his I love case, mafia stories. In his <laughs> case, he was, um, he was a, a very senior money launderer for the mob in the New York mob, right? And he freely admitted that he was, right? Um, are, you, are, you, are you able to say which crime family or do you not want to go there? No, it's not going, I don't okay, think we gotcha, probably not gotcha. going gotcha. to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, he freely admitted hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Wow. And, and he said, look, you know, they were, they've been after me for a while, these guys, right? He was doing 10, doing 10 years. Uh, and he talked, he talked to me about, oh, you know, the first trial, he managed, it was a mistrial. Um, and the second trial was a mistrial, but his his, his attorneys, I was going to say sisters then, his attorney said, listen, they, they're going to get you, right? They're going to get you. He said, so I was I was pretty sure that um, I wasn't going to get off again. They they kept, if it's a mistrial, Jen, yeah. it, they do it again, right? That's, in our case, that was a, is a huge problem, right? Because what happens is you go to trial, and and it has to be a, a unanimous verdict. Even if one person doesn't agree, it's a mistrial, yeah. right? If it's a mistrial, the prosecutors do it to you again because they know the money. You have to have pockets down to your feet to be able to fund all this stuff, right? Yes, cool. It's so expensive to mount a defence over there. So they just go, right, we're going to do you again now. You know, they do a plea bargain or we'll do it again. So in this case, is that they, I knew they were going to do it to me again. And so what I did, he said... Um, <laughs> brilliant story he said i went um i was down in new orleans one weekend and uh, i ended up in a strip joint and um, i had a great time lots of fun at the end of the weekend the guy who owned the strip joint uh, said to me look i'm thinking of selling this place you've got an interest in buying my strip joint and i said what did you do he said yeah i bought it I said, right, it's dub. I went down there, spent two years with all these strippers, <laughs> drugs, drink, sex, and everything. It was bloody fantastic. And I knew I was going down for years and years, but it was a brilliant, it's brilliant fun. At least I went down with a smile on my face. <laughs> <laughs> so it was great. Funny story. Did Wayne then, you said that he was serving 70 plus years. Yeah. Did they say to him, look, will we'll not give you the death penalty if you sign a plea bargain for 72 years or did he go to trial no he, he went to trial it did was he? crime of passion and be, and he, he's, he said the problem with him was that the, because it was a military he was in the military mm. the military wants to make an example of him but the, the trial judge decided because it was a crime of passion that um, they weren't going to put the death penalty on him couldn't you've gone down the route of depression from the war PTSD I, or anything. I don't know, man. I didn't. I, 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 I That's don't. so sad, isn't it? Because, I mean, he just meant to beat the guy up, didn't he? There was no yeah. intention yeah. to murder him. No. But it's death penalty. Wow, it's so mm. strict, isn't it? All right, talking about this, killing people, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> no, mate, this is, it just makes your hair stand on end, right? So there's another fellow I met. It's in my book, right? 
What's your book called? And the link for Giles's book is going to be in the description box below this video. So the book, the book is uh, called Inside Allenwood, which is where I spent um, eight months. There was never, there was lots of mob because of the New York, New Jersey link, right? Um, but there was one other fellow who I spent a lot of time with. Really, I enjoyed. I listen, Sean. You know what it's like. These guys have great stories to tell, right? And you listen to their stories and you kind of think, look at him and think, oh my God, I can't believe you did that, right? And th so this guy, he he came down from the high security prison down into the medium and he he had no, he, he had no respect for the system at all. He was like, he, he would call everybody a just bunch of motherfuckers, right? All of you, right? Or, you know, he just, just cops everybody, no time, no respect for anybody, right? But his cell was just opposite from mine, right? Um, and he came in after I did, so he was more, he was newer than me, right? So I, he was feeling his way around the prison, right? And after a couple of days, he came over and he said to me, he knocked on my cell door, unusual, right? He's like, hey, uh, right, you're Darby, right? I'm like, yeah, he's your Enron guy. I'm like, yeah, that's right. He goes, oh man, my name's so and so. Wow, it's really good to meet you. My son wants to go onto Wall Street. Yeah, you know, I like to talk to you about how you do it. What are the, what do you have to do? And who are the people you speak to? And these, you know these kind of things, right? And I got to know him really well, right? And it turned out that he was doing um, thirty two years, and it, it was all to do with an armed robbery, um, and the armed robbery had gone wrong, and uh, somebody had, inside the mob had told the the um, police force what was going to happen. So the police officers were waiting, right? And they all got away, but they figured out who'd done it, right? And so, so this guy was uh, was charged in the book. I called him Ralph. Ralph was uh, charged with um, killing the guy that spilled the beans, right? And uh, I said, so did you? He went, yeah. I said, well, what did you do? He said, I met him, arranged to meet him one night, and I took a gun with me. And as soon as I saw him, I just took the gun out and popped him. I'm like, what, just like that? He said, yeah, just like that. He said, Darby, you have no idea how easy it is just to kill somebody. Christ. And you go, right, okay. Okay, Ralph, right. You know, and he said, "You are." He's like, "I can see that you're like, I can see the, the look on your face. He's like, I can see you're just completely disgusted." I said, "No, I said, oh, listen, I'm not disgusted, but I'm just amazed at just how easy you just say, tell me that story. That's how you pop a guy." Did he say how he got caught? Um, there was informers. I mean, look, these days, right, the mob is riddled with them, right? You know that. I mean, you, from your own stories. There's more informants than police these days in America. Yeah. Um, so he was informed on. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. So our next guest today is Sarah Jane Baker, longest serving trans prisoner, 30 years. Did you come across any trans? I did. <laughs> <laughs> so we were in, um, we were, when I was in solitary, um, did you go in solitary? Oh, yes. You did, right? Okay. <laughs> it's horrible, right? It's just horrible, isn't it? It's, um, um, you would start to go insane after so long, but it was peaceful and quiet. For, <laughs> I like the peace and quiet of it versus like the just craziness of uh, so all dealing with... solitary. Dealing with lunatics all day wears you out, doesn't <laughs> it? Good. So you get some peace and quiet in solitary. <laughs> I was in Supermax for three months. I loved it. <laughs> 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 so it, when I so I started I, to read and write and just like think. <laughs> wow, well, mate, I know I understand where you're coming from, but yeah. in my case, so I was in solitary. I've been forty eight hours, and you go climbing the walls, just thinking, "Oh my god, this is a nightmare." I, you know, you what? You have too much time to think. You have, how did I get here? What happened? Could I have done something different to not be here? And blah blah blah. Anyway, they come and they knock on the door. Do you want? Do you want yard exercise? Yes, yes, please, right. Okay, right, come on, put your hands through, the, get, put your handcuffs on, blah, 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 get taken out down into the yard, right. I'm in the yard and I'm in a pen, probably about as big as this room we're in now. And I'm just thinking, oh, God, that's the fresh air and who am I in the pen with and looking around. And in the corner is this woman, right? Very attractive young lady, Mexican lady, dark haired, right? <laughs> and I, I look and I'm thinking... <laughs> Fuck, what are you, why are you in here? I said, I went over and said, 
what are you doing in here? And the woman, this woman's going, well, I'm... Um, Hold on uh, a sec, on a sec. I've got a phone vibrating. Oh, sorry. Is it all right to put it on silent? Yes, it is. I didn't want... It's not mine. I, Shit, it's finished now. I didn't warn you, did I, at the beginning? No, sorry. Hold on. I'd, I should do better than that. I'd say no. Thank you. Just messes with the audio otherwise. So, um, so I say to her, what are you, what are you doing in here? And she goes, uh, I'm a guy. <laughs> because as I'm, as I'm chatting to her, there's all these other prisoners in the other kitchen. Get your tits out. Show us your tits. Get your, where's all your tits? Are you going, oh man, what are you, hey, are you a, what are you speaking here for? You're a, Oh, Looking no. at me like I'm, I'm have to block that out. Oh, God, <laughs> just um, right, okay. Kind of uh, just, just. Um, so I kind of, my mind was a, a, a befuddled, right, Sean? You know, right? When it's all happening, you think, oh no, I don't, what do I do? What do I do? I'm like, oh well, you know, okay, well, good luck. She goes, oh I, well, I hope I'm going to get moved on and blah blah blah. Anyway, she didn't get moved on. She was in the prison for as long as I was there, right? Subsequently. Subsequently, what happened is that um, she was in the same unit I was in, and you, for a few packets of fish, you could go into the shower with her and have a bit of fun if you wanted to do Did so. You? Right? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, not in the slightest, Jen. No, good question, but no. no. Packets of fish were the currency. Was it currency in my unit? Uh, ramen, noodle, soup, stamps. I think they had tobacco Stamps. back then. They hadn't took the tobacco out yet. Yeah. Oh. Things like that. We played in yeah. the, because lot, obviously gambling is rife, right? Oh, all Everything. day long. All the all NFL. All the, bl the blacks are slapping down the dominoes. Everything. <laughs> a, yeah. yeah. Every, gambling and anything, right? Yeah. So L was the, ran the prison book in our unit, right? Which yeah. Was very, very funny, right? Because, and after a little while I got to know him, mm. if I was in the cell and he wasn't, they'd give me the betting slips. So I'd mm. end up with all these betting slips in my socks, right? <laughs> and of course, if the, um, if the camp, if the cops find you with betting slips in your socks, straight to bloody solitary, right? So, oh, so I used to wander around, around the compound thinking, oh my God, they don't ask me about what I got in my socks, you know, stuff. Anyway, to go back to the bay. Um, so we played a prison football tournament and our unit ended up in the final and uh, we ended up winning. There was like sort of 500 prisoners watching the final and we knew there was betting on the final. And uh, after the game, the the chief Latin guy in our unit comes into the unit and he goes, "Hey, Derby, there's a couple of packets of fish for you." I'm like, "What for winning?" He said, "Yeah, we won." He goes, "What for? Well, that's our prize." He went, "Hey, man, I just won two hundred packets of fish. Go give you boys some fish each, no problem." <laughs> <laughs> so, what about strip searches then? Did, how did you get used to those, and how intrusive were they? No, I didn't ever get used to them. You, mm -hmm. you just don't do. It's just. Or it's just, it's just very unpleasant, isn't it? It's just the whole thing is very difficult. I, I always remember um, when when we got extradited, um, we arrived in the states, and the first thing that happens is the marshals take you into a room, and they do the obligatory search, right? Yeah. And so I go into this room, um, and uh, he goes, right, um, take your top off, take your trousers off, turn around. Thinking, oh God, here we go, right? He goes, right, and you put your hands up against the wall, right, lift your right foot and take your sock off, lift your left foot, take your sock off, right? I'm like, right, okay. And he goes, turn around. And I'm like, right, I'm thinking, ah, oh, maybe I'm not going to get strip searched, right? He goes, um, and I'm, so I started to smile, thinking, oh God, thank God for that. He goes, what are you smiling at? I'm like, um, nothing, nothing. Yes, you are. Why are you smiling? You shouldn't be smiling. I'm like, uh, I thought you were going to strip search me. Um, what's the problem with that? I said, well, uh, you might put your finger up my ass. <laughs> he goes, do you, do you want my finger up your ass? I'm like, no, I don't, no. Well, good, because if you start stop smiling, I'm going to stick my finger up your ass. I'm like, oh, right, right, right. Fine, right, right. So, okay, oh, no, right. Just... Uh, so did, during your time in there, how often did you speak to your family? Um, we well, get phone time, right? So, yeah. It's obviously being back in the UK. Okay, so that, that brings you to another problem with being inside, which is that if you have nothing on the outside, mm. it's easy to be inside, right? Because yeah. you ain't got nothing to think about. You ain't got no. What are they doing all day? Where are they? What's going on? Are they okay? Mm -hmm. Right? But if you're on the inside with 
a, a huge life on the outside, right? In my case, I got five daughters, you know, lo loads of friends, lots of other things going on in my life. And you just miss it, yeah. Jen. You just, you know, Sean, you just miss everybody. Yeah, of course. No, it's, it's very emotional even talking about it because you you're away from everybody and everything that you know, right? It's so difficult. And so, so what that means is that you tend to try to re restrict contact. To block it. It's just too yeah. hard, right? I mean, one of my daughters was 18. I'd been inside about a month or something, maybe six weeks. And she was, it was her 18th birthday. And that's one with the successful YouTube Lucy, channel. Lucy, yeah, that's yeah. Lucy, one of the YouTubers, one of my daughters. Shout out to Lucy. We'll put a link in for Lucy's channel. Lucy Jessica Carter. Jessica Carter is the name of the channel. We will put a link in because there's an interview where his daughters interview him. That's and I think people will be very interested in that. Maybe in the future we could do something with the daughters and you in the same, you know, get, get. Was it your wife in the background making a cuppa? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I the, noticed that. I couldn't. And then one of the boys, yeah. one of her little boys wanted something. And it, anyway, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but so it's her 18th birthday, Lucy's 18th birthday. And I phoned uh, and I was so overwhelmed with emotion, mm. I couldn't actually speak. So I, I phone her, I think one of her sisters, and I said, hi, hi, darling, can you get Lucy? And Lucy came to the phone, and she's going, hi, oh, Dad, hi, Dad. And I actually couldn't speak. I just couldn't speak. It was mm. so difficult. Mm. It was so hard, right? It, it, look, being inside is hard, it's difficult already. It's very, very difficult emotionally to deal with it, right? Yes. Um, and you have to just... One of the things we said to each other before we went, I went in is, look, I'm gonna, I've got to take care of myself. Or I've got to come out of this. One of the other two lads, Gary Mulgrew, um, still a very, very good friend of mine. He said to me, look, before we go in, you, when you come out, you've got to be healthy. You've got to have your mind together. Cause it, those are the two things. If you, if you have those when you come out, then you'll be absolutely fine. We'll be fine when we come out. But you've got to keep your mind together. And, and you know, it's just, it's so tough. That first phone call to my parents to let them know. And then my What mom, did they say? Oh, God. It was a hard <laughs> one. It was a hard one. They had my back, though, and that was what mattered. But then my mum flying 5,000 miles and seeing her all slumped in the visitation room after going through. Did you let them come, did you? Yeah, Did yeah. you? They came did you every not let your year. Family? They, no. they, they, they insisted. And I was blessed um, that they had my back and came and... Because I know what you're saying. You can like, there's two ways about it. Visits and your mail are gold, but it is that attachment, isn't it? You could, some people just want to get on with the time and not involve their families. Yeah. Some people though live for their visits, and you see some people they never regroup after the girlfriends like stop visiting. They're staring out the window at the car park looking for the the visit, and it doesn't come, and they never recover. Mate, the guy I told you about, the, the mob guy that killed somebody, right? He um, he had been with the same girl since they were teenagers, right? She was an Italian lady from New Jersey as well. Um, and so uh, in his own words, he gave her everything. She was the only girl he'd ever been with, gave her everything. Uh, I, you know, he worshipped her, right? Um, and then when he went inside, she said she would support him and stay with him and which is for 30 years i'm like right seriously right um and so after two or three years the inevitable happened yeah she would come and see him in prison and then um she stopped coming to see him and then his mother came to see him and told him that she'd got involved with another mob guy who he knew that f I mean, can i swear I don't know. yeah you can that after the first fucking motherfucker's fucking guy he's in my room he's in my fucking bed my clothes a fucking guy if i ever fuck, get out of here fucking he's dead right and and so the it, the point is jen women it eats you up <laughs> no no it eats you up i'll tell you what one of the things yeah. i would do because i i i i made i did make uh, look shit we've made mistakes we that's why we're sitting here today made mistakes right um, one of the mistakes I made, I, I got involved with a girl in Texas, right? And it made my time in in this, in in Allenwood harder, harder, because 
you're emotionally like you know man what is she doing where is she i would if i could go back one thing i wouldn't change very much in my book so i actually listen what happens happened i am not about to go back and live all over again and regret it for us us. i am not don't regret it but there are some things i would change and i would have i would have preferred to have gone away with hindsight without any emotional attachments to anybody it would have been made life a lot easier on the inside yeah yeah of Sounds like the beginning of a country western song, doesn't it? I got involved with a girl in Texas. <laughs> oh, brilliant. So, all right, going in then, like your first day, what was that like? Um, look, I said before, it, I, petrified. I, you know, you get to the, you get to the prison. My, we were allowed to self-report, but you, you. I mean, you were picked up and never saw the outside again, right? The day yeah, there. SWAT team. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. It's in our case they allowed us to self-report. So you didn't actually get arrested. Well, we got arrested in England. Oh God, let's let's go back to that. Yeah, give give us the English English arrest. Let's go go through the whole process of. Well, um, oh my gosh, um, I'll try and keep it brief. So please don't. Uh, we love long stories on this channel. So. Um, <laughs> I was an investment banker, uh, very loved my career, loved my life, had a great time, went travel around the world. Um, I was the um, global managing director for energy in the bank I was working for, had offices all over the world. I, I, had, brilliant, I had a brilliant job, brilliant life, everything was wonderful. Um, and Gary, David and I knew Enron very well, we had lots of business with Enron. They were. But at the time, the late 90s, they were one of the uh, biggest financial companies, well, biggest companies in the world. They did the most financings. And so from our point of view, if you're an investment bank, you want to work with companies that are going to do finances and pay fees and blah, 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 right? Um, so uh, we were involved with them and we got to know um, a lot of their people very well. And one of the guys we knew was the chief financial officer, a guy by the name of Andy Fasto. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Now we had, um, I liked him. I dealt with him many times you know, yeah. dinner with him went skiing with him went did all sorts right went you know drank with him this and another very nice guy and uh there was a it was a, a set of circumstances came together where our bank was being taken over by another bank we were leaving to go and join a third bank and andy knew we were leaving and he offered us to get involved in a transaction with him that he knew that if we were leaving one bank to join another bank, there would be a period in the middle when we weren't tied up, we weren't employed, and therefore we could be third party investors into one of his deals, which would mean the whole deal would be off balance sheet. Right? That's enough that's enough of the technical stuff, right? <laughs> so um he invited well Gary was the was the main he invited Gary and and Gary and then he asked Gary if David and I wanted to be involved. And we said, sure. I mean the guy was a, was the um, was voted the number one financial in the world by certain magazines in that in that period. So, if you got a, a wizard like him doing a doing a side transaction, then it's going to make a lot of money, right? So, we we agreed to invest. We invested. We ourselves made a lot of money, um, but as I as I kept pointing out to my attorney later. The money we made was no more than one year's annual bonus I was making anyway. So I, I didn't, if I'd have knowingly done something, I wasn't about to blow up my next 10 years of annual bonuses for one year. I kept making this point. Sadly, no one, no one jumped, no one accepted it. It was like, oh, yeah, you still did it. No, I actually <laughs> didn't, but never mind. It's kind of irrelevant, right? Um, anyway, uh, subsequently, Enron collapsed. So in the wake of um, the 9 11 devastation, right? There's lots of liquidity issues in the markets. You know about that stuff. And um, Enron had secured a lot of its finances with stock. And so what happened was that as their stock price went down because of the issues with liquidity, uh, they had to make margin calls, which basically means putting more money in the security. So if you're securing something for 100, yeah. your stock price goes down to 50, the lender wants another 50 off me. you. They want more <laughs> cash off you, right? Well, Enron didn't have the cash. No. It imploded. So Enron imploded, right? Now, in the whole investigation into what happened, they discovered a number of fraudulent transactions, of which Andy was 
at the centre of everything that went on. By the way, this is this is well documented. He pled guilty to fraud on 70 odd counts for a vast amount of money. So it's all publicly out there and I'm not libeling anybody. This is a matter of public fact, right? Anyway, um, so the deal, it subsequently came to light that the deal we had been involved in was apparently fraudulent. We didn't know at the time, okay? And so we, because um, we were completely naive, had no idea how the US justice system worked. We thought we should tell our employers, tell the financial authorities that we'd had an involvement, divulge everything to them, which we did. Uh, and then we walked away thinking we just did the right thing. We <laughs> did it. We did the completely bloody oh, wrong thing, right? We did the completely wrong thing. What we should have done. Pled the fifth. Uh, and we should have said, we've got information. And if you give us um, a pass, we'll give you our information, right? But we didn't. We gave them the information and got nothing in return, right? We should have 100% of got sort. Got your bargaining chips. Absolutely. Yeah. You got a we, conviction in return. We threw, them all, we threw our bargaining chips away straight away. We didn't. <laughs> we left ourselves with none, right? That's what happened. Right. Time goes by. Six months go by. I'm staying at my, my friend's house in Bath. And uh, we've gone down for a couple of evenings away. And it's seven o'clock in the morning. The phone rings. Um, this is a little bit like your SWAT team, right? The phone rings and it's Mike's sister phone out saying, is Giles with you, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, turn the telly on. I'm like, okay, Mike turns the telly on. And we are the headline news oh, on the... Oh, so that was the first time you'd seen your face? First time I knew about it, Jen. First time Christ. I knew and if it, we were in trouble, right? First yeah. time I knew, right? And Mike gets me out, mate, you're on the television, you've got to come out of here. I'm like, walk out, what? Um, three British bankers are facing 35 years in American prison for involvement in fraudulent dealings with Enron. Mm. I'm looking at television like, that can't be me, like, no way. What was that going is through your not, mind? Well, just sheer terror, right? Just like, <sighs> Well, you know, just wow, and no way. There's absolutely no way. You can't. Thirty-five years. I mean, oh my God, right? That's the end of your life. Of course. It's, that's it. You go in. If it's just Jen. I mean, I I was in shock. I, yeah, days for days afterwards. Gary was in um, Japan at the 2002 World Cup. Actually, we finally got hold of each other, and uh, he said. I said, have you read the indictment? I'm like, yeah. He said, mate, we must have done it. Because the way they framed the indictment, it was a cut and paste job, right? It was it was extracts from emails and presentations. And it just made it look like we were slam dunk guilty as, you know, the worst men in the world. It looked, made it look like, and you're like, God, is that is that right? Well, what, what's, what's happened? So, yeah, so that was the, that was actually, in fact, that was actually the lowest point, actually. That, really? Yeah. Because after that, the shock of it, uh, after the, the, we sort of got through the shock, because all three of us were close, we were good friends, and we we held on to we didn't do anything. We we didn't do it. That was the central core of, of everything that happened, is we knew we didn't do it, but how can we get out of it, right? So... I mean, how about this one? This is a good one. So <laughs> about a month later, so we go and meet our US attorneys. They fly to England. We appoint some attorneys. We didn't know any US attorneys, so you kind of like get led by what first people that you phone, right? Mm -hmm. And we went to meet these people. And um, the guy I met, very very nice man. I you know, just got a lot of time for him, no problem. Uh, he says, right, look, I'm going to go to see the DOJ in Washington. I'm going to go on your behalf. So, so the way it works, Jen, you have to have separate representation. You can't have one guy representing all three of you. No. You all have to have separate representation, okay? okay? So in my case, my guy says, I'm going to go to Washington. I'm going to see what the prosecutors have to say, okay? So off he goes, phones me up. Right, I've been to meet the prosecutors. Uh, you got to plead guilty. I'm like, right, and if I plead guilty, then what? Well... You know they'll probably you, they'll probably fine you. You have to do some jail time, but it'll be over in a couple of years. I'm like, but I didn't do anything. 
okay, so what are you saying? Well, I said, how can I plead guilty to something I didn't do? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, if that's like, is that how you feel? I said, well, actually, it is how I feel. I actually didn't do it, so I'm not going to plead guilty. His answer to me was, man, I love a fighter, right? What I should have said is, no, 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 Giles, do you have any idea how much trouble you're in? Do you actually know what is going on with you right now? Do you have any clue? That's what he should have said to me, right? Now, subsequently, when I received monthly invoices for $20,000, $25,000, $30,000, just every month I'd get, and I'd, I'd get this envelope and think, oh my God, right, how much is this one going to be for, right? And you go, oh, $30,000, fuck, right? Like this, right? You know, so I'm, I'm, by the time I got to America, I was huge dollars had been spent already trying to fight our case already before even getting there, before even a trial, finding defense witnesses, paying for expert witnesses, blah, blah, blah. All the things you have to do, we were in for, we were in for already for a lot of money in any case, right? But the point is, we didn't plead guilty at that point because we didn't do it. Yeah. By the time we got to the States four years later, it was four years we were fighting it, okay? By the time we get there and we get some proper Texas attorneys that are like, spell out to you, guys, do you actually realize the situation you find yourselves in, right? You might be sitting over in England thinking, you know, um, you're innocent so you're proven guilty, but... Um, that is not what happens in this country, right? I mean, you know this, Sean. Over there, 99% of all federal cases plead out. 99%, right? That means that only 1% have the balls to go to trial. And of the ones that go to trial, only, oh, you might tell my stats wrong, but only like 0.3% get a not guilty, right? <laughs> It, it's so it doesn't insane. matter whether you've done it or not. No, no it's insane. Mate. You've got to sign a plea bargain or you go for life. Yeah, and they threaten you with such insane lengths of time that you're like, how do I get out of this? I got to find my way out of this, right? And we had, we had some. We ended up with some brilliant attorneys, brilliant guys, right? Who who cared for us and became great friends, and I still were in touch with them. Great guys, really really nice guys, right? And they, they, they were sitting there and said, boys, listen, right? You, we know you think you didn't do it. We know you think you're innocent, right? We know all of that. Yeah. But you got to, the, their theory of the case is so set in stone. We have to find the way out. There's got to be a way out somewhere that we can demonstrate to them that you didn't do this. And your job, you got to find it. You got to find the way out, okay? And so in our case, that we got unbelievably lucky because when we're over here, David, meet Giles Darby, Gary Mulgrew, David Birmingham. David was um, uh, vociferous in his campaigning, and he's now quite a well-known campaigner against the extradition laws. In fact, he's helped certain people who you have talked about. He's helped certain of the people that are trying to be extradited right now. He's helped. He actively helps these people because he he believes so passionately that what happened to us is wrong. Stomach keeps rumbling. Keep passing me a banana. <laughs> I'm not joking. So, um, so wait, can you hear it? There you go. No. No. Oh, no. Um, Sorry. So was, because our case became so so politically charged, and when we were extradited, it was covered live on the BBC News in the morning. It was on bloody Good Morning Britain. I mean, uh, the plane taking off my, was on the television. It was unbelievable. And uh, because it was such big news, when we got to the States, we thought we were going to go straight inside. Like your point about you're arrested. You're thinking about now, now you're arrested. You're in the States, right? You're going to go straight inside. You have got absolutely no chance, right? So a very well-known newspaper editor wrote an article about in an editorial the day before we went saying, these guys have no chance. They're going to get get to America. They're going to get put straight inside. You cannot mount a defense from inside. You've seen it yourself, Sean, right? You're on remand. You're inside. You might get to see your lawyer once a week for an hour, right? They can't bring papers in. You can't spend hours and hours going through papers or trying to play. You can't do yeah. it, right? You just can't do it. And so if you, go, if you end up inside on bond or on remand, then there's no way you're fighting the case, okay? We, I, I mean, to be honest, we got there. I'm thinking, 
we are we're done we're toast right we are absolutely toast we've got no chance of getting out of this right what happened we're in we're in prison there's a photograph of me on the back of my book of me in handcuffs looking down like this and what I'm, my handcuffs are, are so tight to my ankles and my wrist and then they're chained together right and we're we've just been pulled out of the prison van and i'm literally looking down i'm thinking i can't get my foot up the curb and i'm looking down at this thing and we look completely broken right the three of us just look like we're broken we weren't it was because i couldn't get my foot up a curb right right the picture was flashed around the world it was on the front page of financial times the very next morning right mm. blair and his people had promised that we would get a fair trial we'd be taken care of this that and the other right we're in we're in the houston detention center we've been there two hours this very smart erudite guy walks in to our cell he goes are you guys okay are you guys being taken care of right uh well so far so good kind of thing right he goes we're going to get you boys out of here don't you guys worry you're going to take care of this for you and we're like looking at him thinking who's this guy wow <laughs> what's going on right half, half an hour later half an hour later right um the uh all the um the guys that flew us out walk into our cell right come on guys we're taking you somewhere well where are we going now well uh, you got you obviously got very powerful friends uh, we ain't got any friends not over here right <laughs> joking no friends we got taken to a hotel for the night oh lovely we're taken to a hotel in downtown houston for the night the three of us right we end up sitting down with the um with the 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 fellas that the, all of the a agents that had brought us over we're sitting down we got burgers and fries for i said can i have a beer he goes man you guys are pushing it now you go get you a coke he said you're on remand you can't drink i'm like okay so we end up spending the night in these in the hotel with these guys right next morning we go to the court and david had done a very smart thing he'd hired the only attorney in texas that fought an Enron case and got a not guilty. Okay. A guy called by the name of Dan Cogdale. Amazing, amazing Texan attorney. Everything you see on the telly, brash, smart suits, <laughs> just slick back hair. Just a great guy, right? Great lining one liners, brilliant one liners, very funny man, but also an amazing attorney, right? We meet him. When we, we, so we got the court, we've just been extradited. We meet this guy. Okay, guys, you do you guys realize how much trouble you're in? uh well we're now we're here dan we'll kind of now we do he goes oh, i'm sure you don't but we'll you i'll get to know you. i'll tell you boys i'll get you guys we'll sort it all out da, 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 this, that, and the other. so you're feeling confident at this point not in the slightest gen <laughs> no it, it just everything was just at that point it was just a complete bag of nerves you just oh my god what is going to happen you know i don't know what's going to happen to us right um and uh we end up in the courtroom in front of the judge right and so Dan, on behalf of everybody, he's the lead attorney. He applied for, it's called bond. So bail is bond, yeah. right? So he applied for bond for us all, right? Of course, the prosecution stood up and said, no, these guys are dangerous men. They're a flight risk. They're, they're clearly the indictment proves they're guilty. Well, everything, you, everything you can imagine gets said in a US court, right? You're looking at these guys, looking at the prosecutor, thinking, you are a piece of shit, right? You are, you're wrong. I know you're wrong, right? Awful. So the judge says, well, I'm not inclined to uh, let these men out on bond. Um, I think they may have to go into remand. And so Dan stands up and says, well, actually, judge, I'd like to tell you that between the three of them, they've got over 100 people who have been signed surety paper sh surety ships papers to say they will all stand fifty thousand pounds each um surety ship for these gentlemen so we've got 100 people fifty thousand each you know these are the amounts of many people are prepared to support these people with right and the judge well, where are they all from My friends and family from the united kingdom this that and the other judge okay well okay uh, maybe uh, we should rethink this um and they called the prosecution and dan over and they started chatting and um we were given an hour to go in to think for them the judge to think about what he wanted to do i suspect he was phoning the higher authorities asking what am i going to do with these guys right i don't know what we're going to do right we all end up back in the courtroom judge says right i've decided that under certain conditions, these three are going to be released on bond. 
And here are the conditions. They've got to post half a million dollars of cash bond each. They've got to get a job. <laughs> get a job, right? You're like, how the fuck are we going to get a job, right? We, 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 we are, we are, we are indicted felons, right? <laughs> You know, walk into Starbucks and get a job. News headlines. Yeah, I'm going to get a job <laughs> in Starbucks, cool. right? They're going to take <laughs> us on, right? Get a job, um, and they can't. They can't go outside of Harris County. Houston's in Harris County. Yeah, not allowed outside Harris County in its confines. They've got to be on curfew. Blah blah blah. We're all going. Oh, okay, well, we know where we're getting a bloody job. That's <laughs> that's a problem, right? And then he says, but the most important thing is that um, somebody has to be prepared to take responsibility for these two gentlemen 24-7 until they post their bond. Mm. Well, getting half a million dollars just like that out of bank accounts or out, whatever you got to do to find half a million dollars doesn't just happen, right? So we're like, you know, like no chance, right? We're, gonna, we're going straight inside, right? So Dan stands up and he says to the judge, judge, um, I got a couple of things I want to ask you about. Um, let's get in a job. I'd like to ask you how you think three guys have just been extradited and are charged with the frauds of millions of pounds are going to get a job. Well, <laughs> and, the, and the judge goes, Well, there's BP or there's Shell, there's British companies they can apply to. And Dan <laughs> says, I, Your Honor, I think that's, that's a very difficult condition. I, don't, I think we're going to have to think about that, but but more importantly, how who do you think is going to take care of these men, twenty four hours a day, seven days a week? It's going to take a while to get the money together. And the judge says, "Well, I don't know. Have they, haven't they got any friends over here?" <laughs> and <we're> like, <laughs> just charged with a seven million pound fraud. What do you think we've got? Right. So Dan looks around at us and he and he goes. You know, Judge, these these men. I just met them today, but they look they look to me like they're very trustworthy men. And I'm going to say to you, Judge, I've been married three times, and a fourth time won't hurt. So I'm going to take responsibility for these men. <laughs> right. and, and the judge says, right. Mr. Cogdell, they're going to have to come and live with you. And he said, That's why I might need a fourth wife. Right? <laughs> he said, I, Judge, I will take these men back to my house and they can live with me until they can post the bond. How very kind of him. Jen, it was like the most amazing thing ever. It was just, we we're all sat there in complete amazement, mm. looking at this man thinking, you are absolutely my hero. You are my hero, right? Because we have been straight inside on remand. Imagine trying to get together wow. half a million dollars from inside, Sean. Imagine, it would have been impossible, mate. It just would have been impossible, right? Um, as it was, it was a tough ask, but when you're outside, you've got a chance to do it. You can make phone calls, you can make things happen, right? So Dan Cogdale is the greatest, single greatest attorney, US attorney ever, in my opinion. I've always thought that, and I still think that. So we, we got what, out. What was his house like? Well, you can just put it this way. We drove straight back from the courthouse, um, but Vira's office, and about two hours later, I was sat in his pool having a few beers. Oh, oh nice. With a tag on, mate, nice. at the same time. Yeah. You have shuffled your shirt back, shirt back twice. Oh, there we go. Sorry. A little bit more. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, uh, we ended up uh, outside, which was incredible because that enabled us to fight the case. Yeah. At that point, we could... David, in particular, was unbelievably good he was diligent and he plowed through we were given ten thousand bloody bits of paper and files up the kazoo and it was almost a, an unbelievably daunting task but we knew that somehow somewhere we needed to find a little bit of evidence that would prove that we didn't do it right and unwittingly they gave it to us they didn't know they were doing it but they gave it to us right so what happened about six months on we're just floundering a bit, thinking, oh, man, this is going, we're going nowhere with this. We're trying to get witnesses. We're trying to get evidence. But things we know are out there that we can't find or we can't get. Because in the States, we're trying to get papers from the United Kingdom, which is very, very difficult. So, the, so uh, the prosecutor walks up to us one morning in the courthouse and he says to Dan, 
Um, by the way, Mr. Cogdale, we're going to be uh, releasing the phone tapes to you tomorrow. And Dan's looking at us and we look at him and Dan's going, what phone tapes? There are phone tapes. <laughs> Freaking, wow, there are phone tapes, right? Yeah, there are the phone tapes are these three guys conducting their conspiracy to commit robbery. We're like, okay, that's news to us because we didn't have a conspiracy <laughs> to commit a robbery, right? So we spent 24 hours think what are on these phone tapes what what's up what is so bad about these phone tapes right what they ended up being uh they ended up being tapes of when we found out about enron collapsing fast they're being sacked they're being fraudulent deals there are phone tapes of the three of us we went forward to our employer to say we know about this and we've got evidence and we're prepared to share it with you and gary was in toronto i was in atlanta and david was in london and all the phone tapes were phone calls between the three of us. We didn't know we were being taped. No idea. Unbeknownst to us, we were all the all phone calls, it turns out, in that bank were all taped. So we didn't know we were being taped. And the phone calls demonstrated beyond any reasonable doubt we had no idea. So we were saying to each other, what has he done? Like, well, Fasto's not a crook. He can't, he, he can't have done, he's not, he can't have committed fraud. Like, there's no way he did this, right? We're saying these things to each other, stuff like that. So then we transcribed the phone tapes. I transcribed them, spent three weeks, literally going for about 53 phone calls of it, between of all of us, transcribed everything, and then sent them to the prosecution, saying, you better read these. Did you think you were going to walk at that point? <sighs> I felt good. Sean, I felt good at that point. I did. Um, but we we had something called the law of unintended consequences, right? So we would, what we found early on in the case is we would do something and we try and think about if we do that, what is the consequence of, of, of what's going to happen if we do that? And always something happened we didn't expect. Always, right? And so we called it the law of unintended consequences. So we would come out of the office at night and go, I wonder what they're going to do. If we've, we've done that, what are they going to do back, right? And in this case, what happened, we sent the, um, we sent the phone tapes off. Uh, and a week later, Matt, my attorney, got a phone call. He phones me up. He says, right, you need to come and see me. Why? You know, Giles, it's important you have to come. So I went downtown walk into his office right the feds have been on the phone they're offering you a deal and you know what i'm going to say right uh, and the deal is that you can go home tomorrow all charges are dropped you never go to prison you never pay any money back um i'm like right where's the but uh but you got a test file against the other two mm. pitting you all against each other now brilliant and i'm like matt i can't can't do that He's the Giles, it's a great deal for you. You can go home tomorrow. It's all over. And Matt, they're my friends, right? And what's worse is that I know they're not guilty. I know they're not. So there's no way that I I can't testify against them. He's like, well, look, I'm your attorney, and I have to tell you that I um, my recommendation to you is you think very hard about it. And I, my recommendation is you do it. I said, okay, well, um, I'm not going to change my mind. He said, okay, what I want you to do is go away for two weeks. And I want you to think hard about it, speak to your family about what you're going to do. And in two weeks time, if you still feel the same, then I'll tell them. Mm. I said, okay, well, I will still feel the same. He said, okay, but go and have two weeks. I said, okay. <laughs> Of course, I go back and straight away go to Dan's office. Get Dan, you get, get get the boys, get the boys in, and we got to talk about this. And of course, they're petrified. They're, of course, they're petrified. They, you know, in their shoes, look. Mo most multiple defendant cases break. Yeah. All right. Some point at some point, someone breaks. Right. Someone goes. Oh, I take care of myself, and I'm going to just get out of this get myself out of this and i think that's what they thought we would do i do i think that 
and they approached me first because there was the least evidence against me and I had a big family in the UK. So therefore, was, you know, the emotional ties back were very strong. And the other two boys were really, you know, what are you going to do? I said, guys, I'm not, I'm telling you now, I am not, I'm never going to plead against you or I'll never testify against you. It's not going to happen. We're not, I'm not doing it. Um, and I'm going to say no, but I want you to know what's happened, right? And so, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about it and what to do. Um, and sure enough, I went back and said no. They then approached David and offered it the same deal to him. He said no. And then they said to Gary, what about you? He said, nope. So these three guys stick together. And it's actually quite funny because when I ended up in prison, this nearly bit me in the backside, actually, because what then happened was that um, the prosecutor was like, right, they called a meeting with all the attorneys and they said, what do these three guys want? They got to, they, they've got to do prison time. We Yes, we've read the tapes, but it's so political because Blair's involvement, Bush's involvement, Enron, it's so political, they've got to do some jail time. So what are they going to do? And then that's where we had, you, then you have the no negotiation about uh, we'll do six months. They go, no, six months is too little. You've got to do four years. And then it ends up being, Somewhere in the middle. yeah. And it, what actually happened was that they agreed to send us back to the UK uh, as soon as they could um, on the basis that as soon as we got back to the UK, any jail time is halved. So you go out to the UK and you're done, right? So mm -hmm. we had a headline 37 months and we did 17, something like that. But it was all over. But it was all over because Dan Cogdale agreed to take us into his home. We were out. We could fight the case, find the evidence, and there we go. So wow, that's what a story. So then you had to surrender yourself to justice, did you? Yeah. Once you, so you just went to a sentencing hearing, did you? Yeah. What was that like? Um, <laughs> it's actually quite funny <laughs> behind the side because, because, again, as you know, you have to um, agree a statement of facts. So the law is every all sides have to agree exactly what happened. Statement of facts, right? And um, of course, it's very difficult because our attorneys are saying to us, "You've got to tell the truth. If you, if, if you didn't do it, you can't agree a statement of facts." So we're going. We don't. We've got to agree something because we're going to get out. We don't want to be here the rest of our lives. We are going to get. We've got to find a way, right? We ended up agreeing. That, that we had breached the bank's conflict of interest policies. That's it, right? Now, in this country, that is not a criminal offence, right? But over there, they've got a statute called the theft of honest services. That's what they call it, right? So that fitted under their crime of a theft of honest services, and therefore breaching the compliance guidelines was enough for us to have committed a crime, right? So... We're in we're in the courthouse, and of course the night before we, we by this time we've been in Texas for two years, Jen. Right? Yeah. Have you guys ever been to Houston? Well, never. You've been to Phoenix, right? I've been to Texas as Man, well. Yes. <laughs> wow. What? A, what <laughs> anything? A place. Anything can happen out there. What a place! Right? No country I mean, for all men. Great town. Great Is it? bars, restaurants, nightclubs. We party out there. Yeah, they party. Man, hard. it's yeah, just yeah. Brilliant. everything's outside. The climate's amazing. Oh. Right? There's only one month when you, it's January's rubbish, but the rest of this year, rubbish everywhere. shorts. <laughs> you know, I had a great apartment with a big pool out the back. It was just bloody brilliant. The whole thing was brilliant, right? They've got a whole level of wildness, Texans. Yeah, it, it's like it's a, a different country. I can recommend anybody who's watching this. If you've never been to Texas, you've got to go to Texas. Right? <laughs> it was great. We and in the summer, we had two summers out there, and we had. We had beach houses in Galveston and went down to the beach houses with all the families flew out. And we actually had a, a very enjoyable time while we were there. Anyway, <laughs> um, I'm a big football fan, and so are the other two. And there's a big bar in Houston that shows all the British football. So as soon as we got out to Houston, we went to this bar. It's called the Richmond Arms, right? And we frequented it every Saturday for nearly two years. So we ended up meeting, making loads of friends and lots of people. We played pickup soccer and joined local football teams. And we had a fabulous time out there. So before the sentencing hearing, we had a big party. <laughs> <laughs> 
mm. <laughs> big, it's hilarious. And it, you, you know, they have the mm. banners, don't they? Like, you know, you know, sort of three three bottles for five dollars. Or well, it, the, the banner they put up at the Richmond Arms is "Don't drop, don't drop the soap, guys." <laughs> <laughs> that was our sort of party was "Don't drop the soap party." We end up at the court. We're all hung over from the night before and struggling with it a bit. And the judge says, "Okay." Um, uh, you hear the plea guilty today, yes, Your Honour. Um, I want to just confirm that um, no undue influence of anybody. And you ought to go, uh, yeah, I've just been extradited. I've been facing 35 years and I've got no <laughs> bloody choice, actually. But you go, no. <laughs> and it, yeah, are you under the influence of alcohol? No. Right? Have you taken any drugs? No. Okay, now, Mr. Darby, I'm going to come to you first. I understand today you're pleading guilty to uh, the robbery of $7.3 million. I'm like, no, we're not, Your Honour. Ah, well, um, that's the charge. No, Your Honour, we're today uh, pleading guilty uh, on page three, section 22 of the Statement of Facts. We're pleading guilty to breaching a conflict of interest policy. Ah, okay. Okay, and my lawyers are all looking at me going, yeah, go on, the lawyers go, great, it's all well done, right? And, um, and he said, oh, oh, okay, I'll turn to you, Mr. Mulgrew, right? Now, so that was my little, my little brief moment of kind of, I like, guess, judge, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, but you can't quite say it. You can't quite say it, can you? No. Oh, no, you can't, no. So we had sentences hearing and then we were... We had we then had to wait um, another three months to uh, go to prison, but uh, and I, I, I'm going to come back to, to one of your podcasts. You talked about how I felt facing 200 years, <sighs> right? And you, your life's over, right? You think your life's over, right? Yeah. And um, so uh, we were going to prison. That's it. We're going to prison, right? You you have no idea what you're going to be facing, or no idea what issues or problems or um even if you're going to be able to come out because you know, the violence is is horrifying yeah i mean talk about the violence right you've talked about it in your podcast but, stop. but the um oh every single day every moment right every wherever you are in the prison you're like Ugh, all of a sudden you hear those familiar noises yeah, right, am I safe, someone's right? got thrown around or something yeah yeah are you what okay just you know, is everything okay yeah you sort of check mentally check every few minutes where am i anybody around you what's it like right and there was this one evening because al was brilliant with me the, the um with my celly he said to me look he, he told me at the count the daily count he said there's gonna be some problems tonight he said make sure you, you stay out of the way I said, what do you mean? He said, well, um, a Colombian's been caught stealing from one of the uh, one of the brother's uh, lockers and there's going to be some justice meet, justice meted out tonight in the television room. So in the television room, you just need to stay out of the way. I'm like, okay. So he warned me what was going to happen. Sure enough, later on in the evening, we're in there, there's an NBA playoff game going on and um, I could see all of a sudden that the, the all the black guys are moving towards the door exits, Sean. And they're just standing in with the door exits. They're blocking off the door exits, right? And um, they're, everyone's moving back, moving back. And all of a sudden, they got this Colombian and they just brutalized the bloke. Just, oh, and just watching it was like, wow, you know, horrifying stuff, right? And... Um, of course, they blocked the door so the cops couldn't get in. Nobody mm. could get in, right? That's what they were doing. Um, and of course, eventually the cops did get in and it all got broken up, but the kid was stretched away and never seen again, basically. So, you know, the 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 violence and everything that goes on is, is, is well, shocking, I would say. Um, do you agree with that? Just so they come up to me in the beginning when I was seeing situations like that and they said, look, you got to get that look off your face that, that, or else you're going to get preyed on. Did you find that like six months later, your eyes were dead and you were just didn't show any emotion? Did you go through various stages of adaptation, like shock, adjustment, like fitting in, incorporating the lingo to walk and trying to look like nothing bothers you, those kind of things? <laughs> <laughs> I can just finish that. I, I, now, because over there, it, 
the, the greeting is, what's up? What right? up, dog? What's up? <laughs> what up, dog? That's it. So hey, no, Wood, uh, where are you rolling from, Wood? Right. And it gets abbreviated, <laughs> and, it, and then you end up going, sup? You go, hey, sup? sup? And they, they bump fists, right? So I am ended up <laughs> oh, I bet you two or three months later walking across <laughs> the prison compound with, with guys going, hey, sup, Darby? Like, hey, dog? what's up, man? Yeah, Doggy? Like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Big dog? So yes, is the answer. You just go, oh, God, I know. <laughs> Actually, I mean, it is funny looking back, Sean. But yes, you obviously that's exactly what happens. You you get inured to the violence and what happens. You just and you kind of almost your whole existence, Jen, is mm. just staying out of it. Just stay keep Head yourself down. out. What of was it. your strategy yeah. for that then? Because I was lucky because I had some of my co-defendants in the same jail, including Wildman, who was massive, and people were scared of him. Yeah, you've got your guys in there. So are you like laying low? No, we were in different prisons. Oh, different prisons. Okay, so you're you're flying solo then. Yeah. So is your strategy then just lay low, find out who's who, make alliances with the right people, that kind of thing? Um. Yes, but I also was quite comfortable that because there are respectful crimes, right? Yeah. Right. The bank robbery is a respectful crime, right? If, if you phrase it right. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a bank robber. Yeah, how much do you get away with? Uh, seven million. Seven million, man. Fuck, that's amazing. Seven million, <laughs> right? And by the way, um, how long are you doing? This is what caused, I had a problem with L on this, right? How long are you doing then? Um, three, three years. So then they think you snitched. Mm. Yeah. What? Seven million, three years. What are you talking about? You must be a rat. Uh, no, no, absolutely not. Right, this is in the first conversation. No, I'm absolutely not. No, not in the way. No way. Well, how, can, how do I know you're not a rat? I got my papers. I, my papers are on the way in. As soon as I get my papers, I can show you I'm not a rat. In fact, as a matter of fact, I'm anything but. Because what I did, I turned it. I could have ratted, and I didn't do it. Right. Yeah. So then, right. So to answer your question, you you get some a bit of respect because actually, crimes are respectful crime. You didn't rat on anybody. Uh, and you seem like a reasonable guy, right? So those three things put together. And you're English. Well, and I think that I think they put me with L deliberately. I do think that, and I think they did it because they knew that he was a well-respected figure in the prison, and that if he said good about me, then I wasn't going to have any problems. And I, th and that's actually what then happened, right? So subsequently, the most notorious guy in our in our prison was a mob guy called John Carniglia, right? Now, John is well, you can Google him. He's well known. How do you spell his last name? Carniglia, John Carniglia. Carniglia? Car Car yeah, Carniglia. And John was uh, was a right-hand man of John Gotti, right? Wow. Very well known top mob guy, right? And so he was in his, by, the, by that point, he was probably in his early 60s, I think, right? And uh, I just, it's one of those, you, you say, what's your strategy? Well, stay out of the way. Number one is uh, make sure that people think you're a good guy. Make sure you don't do anything stupid. And you, you, you can't be weak. You have to, you know, stand your ground. If anything ever happens, stand your ground. Fortunately for me, I didn't have any issues like that. Um, but um, I, this guy, he would come in the television room and everybody would sort of walk out of his way. And, you know, you, I, I, one night I sat down, someone said, tap me on the shoulder. He goes, hey, that's uh, John's seat. You can't sit in that seat. Like, okay, fine. Just get up and keep, don't even have an issue with it, right? Stay out of the way. So after a couple of months, there's a microwave room, right? We go and get some microwave from you buy from the commissary, get some noodles or packets of fish or whatever <laughs> you get, right? My favourite was noodles of tuna fish and a bit of mayonnaise and heat it all up. And, but the problem with it is, is the microwave rooms get full. Oh, we didn't have them. Of, oh, you didn't no, have them, right? No, so no, the, no, the, no. the, the problem with the microwaves <laughs> is that all of the younger lads, the, all of the black guys and, 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 and um, Latinos, they fight over the microwaves. <laughs> I'm next, I'm next, get out of the way. Get, I'm, I'm in the queue, yeah, I'm, I'm fifth. Uh, and then he said, oh my God, I don't want any of this. So I would go in the middle of the afternoon to the microwave room. I, I'll be have lunch, go and exercise, and before the count, go to the microwave room, right? And I would, John was there. John would be there, right? And after a couple of times, John's done serious stuff, right? You can look for yourself, right? And uh, he would go, um, 
so tell me, you're, you're, I understand you're an Enron guy, is that right? And I'm like, yeah, that's right. This is the most notorious mobster in the prison. I'm like, oh God, he's speaking to me, right? Wow, what's he going to say to me, right? And uh, he said, uh, yeah, so uh, you know about Wall Street, do you? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I do, John, yeah. Well, my son wants to get on Wall Street and I need some advice. <laughs> I want to talk to you a, bit, a little bit about how you, what, how you get on Wall Street. I want some share tips and stuff. Can you help me with that? I'm like, yeah, of course. Like, like, whatever you want to do, right? And so I, I ended up then becoming friendly with him. So I chatted to him every day. How you doing, John? What's going on? This, that, and the other. And after a couple of months, he, um, he says to me, Darby, it's been a real privilege to meet you. It's been real, real nice to meet you. Enjoyed our conversations, but I'm leaving the prison tomorrow. I said, what, what are you leaving for? Have you got a medical thing or what? He said, no, no. He said, I've got a parole hearing coming up uh, in, in New York in a couple of weeks' time, and I'm being transferred to New York to do that. I said, right, so you got, you're got you going to get out? He said, oh, yeah, i got a great chance. So I the the cops are supporting me and probation is supporting me, and I think I've got a great chance. Um, I said, how long have you done? Uh, 22 years. I'm like, wow. Uh, well, wish you luck, John. Good luck. Right? And shook his hand and walked away. Right. Time goes by. Two weeks later, I'm in the, I'm in the microwave room. <laughs> John shuffles in. Ah, John. Didn't go so well then. No, Derby didn't go so well. And I, what what have they done? Uh, they told me to come back in ten years. Oh, and you go, oh. fuck. I even I just you just oh, your whole like you think oh John man that's thirty two years oh my god right. And uh, funnily enough, um, he just he did just get out. Did he? Yeah, he's, he's on parole now. He's yeah. in his seventies now. Then is he? Yeah, but it was like, oh God, your, your sort of heart sinks for these guys. Sean, the the sentences are so long. You must have. They hand them out like candy. Yeah. You know, if the prosecutor can get you a 200 year sentence, and there was a guy before me on a drug case, refused a 15 year plea bargain. They, he had 20 plus charges, found guilty, stacked all of his 10 years up to 200 plus year sentence. So prosecutor makes headline news. She wants to become a judge or a yeah, senator yeah, or yeah, some yeah, shit. Yeah, so yeah. that's how they rise up. Yeah. I mean, the bigger crooks in the justice system than there are in the prison. We were told they're league tables of months, right? So all the sentences are months. So in our case, it was like, right, 420 months. Yeah, 420 months, what's that? You go... 420 months, divide that by 12. Shit, that's like serious amount of time, right? And and they what they do, um, the prosecutors, they earn their, their points about you you rise up the ranks by getting month. More the more months you get, mm. it's just the system is absolutely insane, in my in my opinion. The more time you get, the more their careers are enhanced. And the police have got arrest quotas, prosecutors sent sentence court you know the more sentences yeah like you said it's just it's all incentivized to fill the prison system and, and get you in there for as long as possible so all these parasitic corporations can maximize the profits but it means that the oh, we're getting back on the sort of social yeah, welfare we are. stuff but, so let's get back to <laughs> but, it, no, but it means that the prisons are full of people who have no hope Yes. No hope. Yeah, Absolutely yeah. no hope. And therefore, they don't care, right? So <laughs> this yeah. guy, right? One guy we were with, I was sat there one night, and uh, he was kicking off about the television channels and this, that, and the other, and um, he was arguing with people, and he was uh, he, he, he caused some problems in the unit, and then he just disappeared for a couple of weeks. And I said to him, well, where's that guy gone? He goes, oh, he's gone out on, um, he's gone out to a halfway house, right? So you, when you go being released, you go halfway house, then you go probation, then you get released, right? So this right. guy gone to halfway house. All right, off he goes. Right, a couple of weeks go by. We're at the camp. This guy's being marched down the unit, right? He's like arguing with everybody, arguing with the cops, this, that, and the other, right? He comes into our cell that night, and I says, I thought you were halfway house. What are you doing? Yeah, I told those motherfuckers. I told them what to do with themselves. He said, I was like, well, what did you do? He goes, well, over there, they, the black guys wear their pants halfway down their backsides, right? Yeah. So their backsides are sticking out all the time. He goes, and I, I was in the halfway house and I just kept wearing my pants down by my backside, like that, whatever language they use, right? 
And I was going, you, why? And why is that why you're back here? He goes, yeah, because they kept telling me to pull my pants up and I wouldn't do it. I told them to go fuck themselves. And I, and I was going, what? So, just because you wouldn't pull your pants up, <laughs> right? You come back to prison rather than get released. Yeah, I told those motherfuckers. And he's like, mate, are you for real? Is that, is that re seriously? Right? That's the kind of Mentality thing. Institute it's yeah. insane. Yeah. I'm like looking at this guy thinking, I don't believe what you're telling me, right? But there you go. So did the Texas Aryan Brotherhood, I'm sorry, you're in Pennsylvania. The Aryan Brotherhood, um, were they present? Yeah, they were cool. They were, they liked all the stock car racing and they had, you know, they, they, they had shaven heads with tattoos on their sides and they, they would, same thing, Sean. You know, they come up to you and go, right, I've heard about you. You're that guy, you're that bank robber, right? And you go, yeah, oh, well done. Great one, you know. I'm like, well done for, oh, yeah, you did it. Great job. I'm like, I didn't, I'm in prison. I didn't get away with it. I mean, <laughs> What kind, what kind of tattoos then? Can you, can you remember? Oh, just the stuff on their sides of their heads, mate. I didn't really yeah. pay a great deal of attention. If I'm honest with you, I didn't <laughs> <laughs> pay a great deal of attention to it, really. Because it's the federal stuff, right? Mm. So it wasn't, it's not so bad as the state stuff. State's more right? run down, isn't it? Yeah, they, they, yeah. It's not so prevalent. Mm. And they kind of, um, the, the gang stuff is always there, like everything else. But it, Gary Gary uh, had a book out called Gang of One because he was in um, he was in Big Spring in Texas and he his strategy was to just stay out of it all not be in a gang just be just be a decent guy be a good guy share funny stories with people but not get involved and I, mine was similar I just I, I just didn't want to be involved in the nonsense that's it really so what was your day-to-day -day routine like? Oh, I, um, laundry stuff, working in the laundry. Take the us mornings. from when you wake up. <laughs> so is it like Charles in the house? <sighs> oh, you see, well, of course, it, we were in three in our, we had three in our cell and they turn all the lights on at six o'clock in the morning, don't they? Yeah. So the lights, well, that's it. You have, yeah. you've got to wake up. There's no choice. You've got to wake up. L works in the factory. They, they made, um, make furniture for the courthouses and schools that so he worked there so he'd be up and out quickly and then the other guy then so did t the other two guys they both went so I'd, i would have half an hour to myself which is a quite pleasant time in the morning and then wander over to the uh to the lawn to the breakfast and get some breakfast what was breakfast like horrible <laughs> just an apple normally or something some moldy bread or a little bit of yeah a little bit of coffee or something but just I mean, I lost two stone when I, I was did in as there. well. Just like, it, yeah, it's hot, just shy, isn't it? It's horrible, isn't <laughs> did, it? Did you like go for a pain barrier? You know, like, you, you, you like you're dreaming about food, you're thinking about food and everything, and then you just go for like this pain barrier where you detach from it and you realize, you know, all that food I've been eating, like three or four meals, I, don't, I really didn't need that. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't go to the toilet, I take a shit like twice, a day, two or three times. <laughs> you need to take a shit like once every day, every two days, really. <laughs> <laughs> The funniest one was, was, was the, the Bureau of Prisons gets given all these, get, gets given the leftovers nobody else wants. Oh, so, so the, food, yeah. right, so the, the chickens, so what's, what all the producers do, all the breasts and wings and legs get given to the supermarkets and stuff. And the Bureau of Prisons gets the undercarriage of the chicken. The, oh. the, if you pick the chicken up like that, it's on the bottom, isn't it, right? And then they, we would get a quarter of the undercarriage of the chicken. Right, so we would get once a week. So you get this bit of chicken and you would basically just pull the bones out and end up with a pile of bones and a little scraggy bit of meat, right? And that I never thought I would figure out where the saying, pick the bones out of that came from, right? But that is where it comes from, right? Just picking the bones of a piece of meat and being left with basically a mouthful. And that was lunch. It was, just, it was terrible, right? Or we had this macaroni cheese that would, they would stick to the wall if you threw it at the wall. We had that. <laughs> we had that. It was like no, just I could a, never eat it. No, never I didn't. It. I gave it, it away, Can you mate. eat it now? 
No. <laughs> no, no it's like a, a sticky <laughs> mess. Like you, oh, I'll throw it out of the wall and it'll stick. You know it's going to stick. And then the other one we had, you're right, it was, we had sewer trout. They, we would all call it, it was like a piece of fish. And it was it, it was tasted so horrible that's that you was like, oh, that's out of the sewers. Did like, you have a favourite meal out like, of all the bad shit that they served up? Oh, just the burger and fries we had once yeah. a week. We had deep, wow. yeah. yeah, we had a burger. But I, listen, it was just like, grisly meat and horror just it, it was edible right well i, I convert because of the red death mystery meat slop that had <laughs> dead rats in it on occasion i converted to a vegetarian religious diet so i never had to eat any meat yeah but it still wasn't much cut but what, was, what had rats in it <laughs> we had this mystery meat slop called red death <laughs> And okay, one time, for example, we gave a dead rat back to the guards and they said they would investigate it. <laughs> and they took, the, they took the dead rat with them. And then later in the day, they just came back and said, we made a mistake, it was a potato. <laughs> <laughs> so no one could sue the jail. We didn't have any evidence. <laughs> but Sheriff Joe Arpaio was notorious. I mean, there was boxes not fit for human consumption. There was cans from the 1970s they were using in, 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 his, in his slops. Um, some of the prisoners managed to get some of that stuff to lawyers to sue the jail because he didn't spend anything at all on the prisoners. Like hundreds of millions went missing under our pile. So your cell prison sounds like Michelin style compared to that, doesn't it? So, Listen, yeah. like, Sean was in a state unit. State, yeah. 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 state yeah. is the worst. Yeah. But I mean, the other thing, <laughs> we did have some funny stuff because in the laundry, we had, we had, we called her the laundry Nazi, right? She was the woman who ran our laundry and she hated men hated men with a passion right and so like unbelievably some guys in prison are allowed to get married right okay so once a year they all have these pen pals and this that, and the other and some woman will come in and decide she's going to marry a long-term prisoner for whatever reason right and um funny stuff the, 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 on this day there were five guys getting married in the prison okay and the day before they were getting married, they came into the laundry and they were allowed to get new uniform, right? Well, what she did, she gave them quite deliberately uniforms that didn't fit. Right? Oh. <laughs> so you get a little Wicked fat short lady. guy, she give him long trousers. Oh. And sort of, <laughs> on his wedding day? <laughs> yeah. Or, or, or some or some big fat guy would have like, a shirt that didn't do up with oh, the buttons. What like, brilliant. Right, so I said to her, we, we knew she was doing it, and when they all left, I said to her, because I'd been there four months by then, and I'd, I'd struck up a bit of a rapport with her. I said to her, um, why did you do that? Are you, this is their wedding day. No, idiot, wedding? Idiot, idiots. What stupid woman would come in the prison and marry a prisoner? A, absolute idiot. She said, and then what happens? She said, do you know what happens, Darby? I'll tell you what happens. They go back to their cells and they have sex with each other in the cells. I said, what, men? Yeah, she said, you can't even, don't even get conjugal rights. I said, I worked in the penitentiary, she said, and I saw it where two guys that got married on the same day ended up going back to wearing their cells and they had sex with each other in the cells. <laughs> That's what goes on, she said. That's a wedding. She said, no chance. Wedding disgrace shouldn't be happening. This sort of thing was going on, right? Anyway, the next day she came in and she said, um, right, come on then. How many wives turned up yesterday? I'm, I'm sure you lot all know by now. And we're like, uh, no idea. One. So there was one <laughs> came of all five. One. That, that's my point, Darby. That's why I give them the wrong, the wrong things to wear. That's why I do it. <laughs> yeah. So um, there's a thing called gay for the stay, isn't there? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Never heard of it. No, before you ask, Jen, absolutely not. No. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. No. Oh. No. So they got the girlfriends and the wives visiting them, but they got a boyfriend at the same time that their girlfriends and wives don't know about. And when they get out, they go back to a normal relationship with their girlfriends or the wives. Gay for the stay. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> what was the commissary list like then? Could you supplement the shite food with some commissary at least? Yeah. Um, wraps, noodles, um, rice, just typical stuff. I mean, the best thing that the commissary day was always the best day for food. Yeah. Because <laughs> you, you would get, we'd have sort of chefs in the unit who would, on the outside, they worked in restaurants and stuff. And they would uh, they they would come to you and go look I'll make you if you buy the stuff 
I'll make you some wraps, right? So what I would do is, is once a week, we buy wraps and refried beans and the rice and the packets some of burritos. fish. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and the chefs would, I'd get them to make five burritos, right? And I'd give one to the chef for making it, two to my sellers, and one to the, 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 the one of the mob guys I watched the news with at night. We'd sit and once a week we had a nice burrito once a week. <laughs> so it was the best. It was the best day of the week. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was the best day of the week. What about hooch? Okay, I'll tell you a story about hooch. <laughs> it wasn't. It, it wasn't in Allenwood, but I was. So that guy I told you about who got put back in for not wearing pulling his trousers up, right? So that night I'm out at the uh, out in the in the unit and um, I was chatting to a couple of lads and saying. I've never met a man quite so stupid as to come back to prison for not pulling his trousers up, right? That didn't make any sense to me, right? Mm -hmm. And this guy um, was was sat where you are, Jen, and he went, yeah. he, he said, excuse me, I said, can I just, I've overheard what you just said. Can I, do you mind if I join the conversation? We go, no, sure. He goes, well, I've got a, I'm, I can say something more stupid than that. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> he said, he said, well, yeah, his name is Glenn, very, very nice guy. He said, so when I was a young man, 18, 19, I had uh, two felony convictions for aggravated assault. And obviously over there, Sean, three strikes and you're out, right? So he had two felony convictions, which means the third one is an automatic 15 years, right? He said, so I came out for my second, I'd been inside a few months and I came out and uh, I won't go into why, but um, I needed a rifle, I needed a firearm. Right, okay. But when I went to get the firearm, you got to tick a box and I've got no prior felony convictions and I ticked the box. And so now I've that's a felony conviction. For lying on the form is a third felony conviction, right? Right. So um I I was uh, I was in my flat a couple of days later and I came out and there was SWAT team. There's ten of them surrounding me, putting guns at me. And I'm like, I don't even know what I've done. I was, he was, he said I was a young guy when it happened. I was probably in my mid twenties, and um, I just like looking at them all, thinking, "Oh my God, what's happening?" And I was taken down to the cop shop, and um, my sisters came to see me, my put attorneys, and said, uh, "I'm really sorry to tell you this, but um, it's the third felony conviction you've lied on a form on this form." He said, "Yeah, and so what?" And uh, it's an automatic 15 years. He's like, was that a felony? Because he lied. Me, it? It, mm. Well, I would have thought so. But he said, and he said, I just, I lost it. I lost mm. it probably for about three years. I lost my mind. Everything, my life was over. Everything. And ended up in the penitentiary, ended up being the guy that made the hooch in the penitentiary, right? And because he was make, the one making the hooch, which is sugar and yeah. fruit juice and stuff, they let it all um, ferment, uh, ferment, ferment yeah. yeah. And uh, he kept having his good time taken away, right? So good times, if you behave yourselves, you you might get 10 days at the end of the year, give you back 10 days good time. But over a long sentence, that good time actually built up to a few months, right? So this is where I can tell you a more stupid story than that, right? So he's making the hooch, and he's the prison hooch guy. He kept losing good time. And in the end, he said, yeah, f you cops can f go fuck yourself. Take my good time, right? Just take it, right? And the cop went, well, all of it. He went, yeah, f take, take all of it. Did you have good time? No, you had club free freedom, though, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> he, went, he went, fine, I'll take it all. Take all your good time. So over 15 years, good time is a few months, right? Yeah. And he said, and, and Glenn looked at us and he said, and guess what? I said, what? He said, I'm serving my good time now. Oh. Man, that's all over hooch and oh. everything. Yeah, I know. And then he then, talk about they've got nowhere to go when they get out. Mm. He then came out, contacted me on social media, uh, and then a couple of years later, his girlfriend messaged me. I'm really, really sorry to tell you, but Glenn died of a of a uh, drug overdose. Oh, that's that's so sad. Sad. Mate, what a sad life that is, yeah. right? Yeah. Fighting and then getting a firearm. I mean, over there, half of them have got firearms anyway, right? So, God, yeah. just uh, yeah, uh, the thing is that you can tell these sad stories all bloody day long, and it doesn't change anything. That's true. It's an uncaring system, isn't it? 
Yeah, there was mate, the other place that was shockingly bad, and this is and it gets into your levels of state stuff was the MCC, right? Mm. So the so the Manhattan Correctional Center is a high rise prison in downtown Manhattan, so in New York, right? Right. And it's on forty floors or something like that. And it's abs it's a high security place. Um, and it, it, everything about it is high security. You're in there and you, you can't go from one part of the prison to another without going through thick locked doors. Everything has to be opened or what have you. And, um, I went, uh, I got, ended up in solitary there as well. Cause when you get there, go straight into solitary as usual. And, um, it's funny one morning it was Thanksgiving. It was November. I got sent home in late November. And um, it was freezing cold, and they come on knock on your door at five in the morning, and they go right. Who wants, who wants exercise? You go, I do, I do. Right, of course. What you don't realise is it's on the top of the skyscraper, right? And it's five o'clock in the morning, and it's freezing bloody cold, yeah. and you've got a short sleeve jumpsuit on, right? So mm. you get, <laughs> you get to the top of the of the um, skyscraper, and they go right, open the door. There you go, and you're like. <laughs> fuck it's like <laughs> minus degrees it's freezing <laughs> freaking cold there was only three of us right yeah. so we sort of spend five minutes sort of jogging running and thinking god you can't get warm right? there's no chance of getting warm because you're you're underweight by that point right you're freezing freaking cold there's no way of getting anything on you yeah and we end up like huddling under the air conditioning trying to sort of just keep your eye you put your arms inside your jumpsuit and you're trying to keep warm <laughs> and then you're knocking on the door going going uh, officer, officer, officer. He go, yeah, what do you want? Uh, can I come back in? No, you stay outside. It's your own choice. You want to go out, stay out there. Go, uh, can I get a coat? No, we ain't got any coat. Stay out there. So, so by an hour gone, you're absolutely bloody like an ice pack, right? It's so coming back down in the lift. Uh, um, we had a, I had a little bit of fortune. Coming back, back down in the lift. A senior ranking officer of the prison got in the same lift, right? So I'm like... Uh, excuse me officer he's like yeah i said look i'm just in transit back to united kingdom i'm freezing cold just been up the top of the roof he goes that was a bit silly wasn't it i said well yeah but i wanted to go outside i said anyway i'm in solitary sir as i shouldn't be in solitary i haven't done anything wrong he's like he's like, oh, okay what's your name uh darby he goes darby and your prison numbers on your jumpsuit anyway he goes yeah I, okay um, let me think about it i'll see what's going on with you anyway fortunately for me later that day i was they came and got me out of solitary and I was put back in the general population, which is really, which is great because it's just in the Manhattan Correctional Center. Oh, it, the roofs are really low. See here, we've got a nice space up through, but it's all low, Sean. Everything's, you're like really, everything's low down. It's cramped. There's the cells and the doors are thick, bloody doors like that. It's just, I mean, to be in there for any period of time, is just miserable you would lose your mind definitely i have no idea how the lady uh how Jelaine maxwell is even beginning to cope with it right look i have no clue what she's done right everyone has a view but blah 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 but even so she will be having the most miserable time of her life in that place they've given her a whole floor to herself have they yeah what well, to protect her yeah because it's so high profile and god yeah yeah so um what was like the general population in there like racially how was it mixed up uh it wasn't it was all blacks was it yeah this is new york then yeah we were there um when obama got but as president actually mm -hmm. and um you'd have thought they'd all won the world cup or something right they were no, seriously when the night he was elected mm. there, there was all night long they were clanging the prison cell doors and cheering and every, i think they all thought he was gonna let them all out or something <laughs> <laughs> So what did they make of you then, this white boy, all of a sudden, an English white boy? A usual story, mate, just tried to just stay out of the way. I mean, I look, I um, the other thing I got quite in, involved with over there, I, I really enjoyed the sport. So the American football and the um, the baseball and everything like that. So I was able to have conversations with, with them about stuff like that. And they, oh, yeah, you like, you like football? What do you know about football? Who's your team? I bet Texans. being an intellectual guy helps you quite a lot in all of this. I, I think that the ability, I, I, this is you, I'm sure, the ability to mix across 
completely different levels of society and to be able to converse and bring yourself down to a level mm. uh, is huge. Yeah. And uh, also huge. they see you as a resource because you can read their legal paperwork. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, oh, yeah, we we always, you know, talk to them about their cases. I would I would discuss cases with with them about what what you're doing about this and oh I'm going to appeal and okay what's your grounds for appeal what are you doing you'd have conversations like that that'd be regular yeah. conversations yeah that kind of thing Sean's right that's for them these guys have got no money they yeah. can't they don't know what they're bloody doing they can't appeal their case Both of them no can't even read all right when I was that no that's yeah. it yeah yeah so if you can fit in any way they will fit you in but if you don't fit in you will perish <laughs> <laughs> yeah so did anyone sweat you at any point? Any guards or any prisoners? Um, no, no, the most frightened. I, 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 a couple of times I was, I did. Oh God, yeah, how did this happen to me? It was, but it was all. It, it was just miscommunication. So in this particular case, there was a, there was a very, very well-known Russian mob guy in our prison, right? And he was a, he, he was a fearsome character, right? He'd been shot a few times. I subsequently Googled him and he's a very, very le a lethal prisoner. But there was another guy, a Russian guy, who was a diplomat in there, okay? And uh, he knew me from, he came out, I'm Mr. Darby, I, and he called me Mr. Darby. Mr. Darby, how are you? It's lovely to see you. I've read about your case and I'm being deported for espionage. And But I know, you know I've been in Washington. I know all about the Enron. I know what happened. And I'd love you to meet you. And, this, and by the way, this is so-and-so, right? You go, right, okay. And there's this guy who's hard as nails, hard as rocks. You think, oh, God, right, this guy. Okay. And we would chat and talk about Georgia and Moldova and talk about the Central Asian states with him. And he knew all about it. It was from there, right? Anyway, he obviously he he was a bit of a law unto himself. He he wasn't he wasn't in with the Italian mob. He kind of was a separate to them, right? There was a couple of um, Italian mob guys who'd who um, when I was on my induction course, I was w sat with and helped them read their papers and help them sign their paperwork and the sat. So I knew these guys just because they were uh, they were happy with me for what I did. I helped yeah. them, right? So they go, oh, hey, Darby, how are you doing? And I'd chat with him and this, that, and Anyway, this one guy um, was starting a 40, was just starting a 40 year sentence for extortion and all other mob related things, right? 40 years, Sean, right? And so he was, was often in space mentally. He was often, he was I'm off. Surprised. He was. He, he, he told me he was a family man. He had family and so on. And so on this occasion, uh, I'd been sat with these two guys and um, uh, chatting about various stuff. And they got up and work, went uh, walking around the compound. And the other fella, Mike, was walking by. And I, hey, hey Darby, how you doing? I said, hey, Mike. I said, do you know those guys? He said, he's. He said, no, no, I don't know. I said, look, they're really nice guys. You, uh, you're doing a long stretch. You should, you know, these guys are here for a long time, so you should catch up with them sometime. Said, oh, yeah, thanks very much. Off we go. Next evening, we're getting ready for a football game, right? And I'm kneeling down, putting my boots on. Next thing I know, a Russian guy stood right by me with his knee right by my head, right? Derby, yeah, get up. And like, right. And Andre was even the diplomat. I go, yeah. He goes, what did you say to that mob guy last night? Uh, I went, um, uh, 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 okay, I don't remember, I don't remember. He said, you better remember right now you've got 10 seconds or else you've got a lot of problems. I'm like, right, right, okay. And Andrew's going, he's going, he's telling this guy's name. He's going, no, no, Darby's a good guy. Don't be like this with him. He's like, no, what did you say? I said, right, um, uh, I said, you guys are really good guys and you should get to know it. He should get to know you. And I'm like, Shaking like this, yeah. <laughs> he goes, and Andrew goes, see, I told you, I told you he would say, he wouldn't say anything bad about you like that. He goes, are you, are you looking at me like, are you really, really? I'm like, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I am. He goes, okay, I'll let you off on this occasion. Be, be, be very careful what you say to people. Uh, okay, right. Do you think he was just heart checking you, or someone had like gave him something to try and set you up? I think he was just 
actually wanted to know what I'd said because he was such a fearsome character that, and he had such a beef with the Italians. For some reason, I don't know. Who knows what goes on? I think he was just like, careful. So, so yeah, that's, that, was, that was actually the only time I was really frightened for myself. I'm sure you had plenty of occasions. Oh, yeah, yeah. What about the guards then? Did they, any of those were particularly rude to you? No, 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 I, no, I can't say that, no. That's no. good. They, no, I can't say that. They just, only the strip searches was the worst bit, wasn't it? That's, that's the worst thing. Did they have the foreskin search where you were at? No, mate. <laughs> they had the foreskin search for hours. Oh, God. First time, the guy's like, I'm like, are you serious? He's like, yep, you could have drugs in there, pull it back. <laughs> I saw you like that. It's just like this. Stay on your dick. On, Keep gazing. <laughs> Mate, on that, well, we had to split split your cheeks and that stuff, right? Touch um, your toes. Touch your toes, split your cheeks, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Um, but I asked the, la the laundry Nazi one time, after I got to know her quite well, she was kind of quite friendly uh, in the end, right? I said to her, come on then, you, you've been in the prison. I've only been in the prison. She said, oh, about 35 years. What? I said, you've seen a lot, haven't you? She said, I have. She said, yes, I've seen all sorts. I said, what's the best story then? Come on, you must have some good stories. She said, well, she said, it's not a good story, but but the most strange story, and it caused a lot of problems in the prison, was that there was a well-known mob guy who'd been inside for some time. And uh, he was going around showing people prisons of a ba picture of a baby. He was telling people that he just had a baby, but he'd been right. in prison. Like, it's, we'd all go, how did that? That can't be right. What's happened, right? So um, the prison, we had an investigation of, of what had happened. So we pulled him in and said, how can you be going around showing people pictures of a baby? You, I, you can't possibly be right. And he said, oh, no, he's, no, no, it happened. He said he, he bribed a guard. Um, Take and, a cup of his sperm or something. <laughs> well, the guard brought a squash ball in and the girlfriend was out in the car park and um, the guard brought the squash ball in. He did his business into the squash ball. And then he, the guard rushed the squash ball out to the um, car park and she had a syringe and she inseminated oh, herself. And uh, the guy was, look, that's the story, right? That, that is a story. And whether it's right, I have no idea. But that was the story that she told. And she said that was the like, oh most weirdest story. She said, you know, the guard ended up inside he shouldn't, you know, for helping the mob and this, that, and the other. Wow. Yeah, but there Holy you shit. go, mate. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you mentioned earlier about, you know, you were threatening to do something with his finger in your bum. <laughs> in Arizona, they did have the finger wave, but it got ruled unconstitutional because it led to strip searches whereby guards raped prisoners and stuff like that. Did did they not have that? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm just God. That's just... Yeah, they did have it. The finger wave, they called it the prisoners. But I was lucky because I got arrested just after it had been ruled unconstitutional. Look at you. Yeah. <laughs> Mate, it's, it's fearsome stuff, isn't it? I mean, it's isn't just it? horrible stuff. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I, I, I think that the when someone once said to me, look, one of the other prisoners said to me, look, if you... Think of the worst thing you can imagine. Yeah. And it, it happens in prison, right? The, mm. Whatever you can imagine, like rape guards raping you or male prisoners raping you or being held down. or He said, look, it happens, right? You just have to make sure you try not to be in a position where it doesn't happen to you, right? Somehow, some way. And every sort of living moment, Sean, was... You had my point earlier about you'd always looking around and what looking over your just, shoulder, yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. About you know, make, what position am I in? What where am I on the compound? If I if something happens to me, how do I find help? What you know, stuff like that. Always That's looking for it. Was yeah. your adrenaline going all the time then? Always, mm. mate, yeah. All, always. Never well, felt safe, Sean. Has that affected your behaviour to this day? Like, do you prefer to have your back against the wall or something, you know, when you go out, things like well, that? Well, I kind of, uh, I've got kind of, I mean, I, I watched one of your um, presentations about, you know, what, how, your, how your mental state changed if you're looking at 200 years and how you how you handled it yourself. And I think that, that, that look, look, you can't come out of this stuff without being changed, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people are full of worse because they cannot recover. They can't recover from what's happened to them, right? 
guys like you and me have been unbelievably lucky in, in as much as you got family support, lots of friends supported you all the way around, same in me. And so you've been able to come back and come out of it. I would argue, I didn't know you beforehand, I would say a much better person, nice man. Yeah, you know what's right and what's wrong. And I think I feel a bit like that about, well, you know, um, I, I, as I said earlier, I don't regret any of it. It was an amazing life experience. I, I would rather not add it, but we did. You've had it. Butt. And look what Sorry. you're doing now. I mean, you're, you've now got this very successful career doing what you're doing. I've uh, My life is wonderful. I love my life. I'm very, very lucky. And I have five daughters, 10 grandchildren, a wonderful wife. I'm just incredibly lucky, right? And But you come out of it definitely, definitely not the person that went into it. Absolutely no doubt about that. So you appreciate the small things now? There's no doubt about that. I mean, and, and sadly, as you get more to my age, friends die, things that people, I've got a very close friend of mine that had a stroke recently, and you just thank, thank your lucky stars for all the little things out there, just day-to-day -day stuff. I mean, even this is lovely meeting you all. <laughs> it's great. It's nice. Yeah, I'm enjoying meeting you and chatting about it. And, you know, the book's been a really interesting thing. The book uh, it's been, been, it's had a great reception. It's been lovely. I did it mo ma mostly for my family. I wanted them all to know all the things that happened. So when I'm older and my grandkids grow up a little bit and they know so what happened. It's more like a confession. Well, no, um, no, there's nothing to confess, Jen. No, I didn't, well, no. not anymore. <laughs> there was more like, look, look, I got stitched up. This is how, this is what happened. You can read it or not. It's up to you, but and it's have there. have they read it? Have they all my daughters all have. My daughters, yeah, yeah my daughters are. Because well, because they were all much younger when it all happened. So yes, yeah, um, and and Sean said there's a there's a, one of them did an interview of me about the whole thing, and mm. it's had a six hundred fifty thousand hits on YouTube. Believe it or not, so that's yeah. Jessica and Ellie. Yeah, yeah, so Lucy, Lucy, Jessica, Carter, and Ellie Darby. Yeah, Ellie. That was Ellie and Jessica. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we'll yeah. put the link in the description box if people want to watch the interview with his uh, his daughters talking to him. It's it's really good. So, what was the deportation process? Hmm. Right back here. Yeah, you yeah. had to get deported from where you were at. Did you? Could you know your secure <clears throat> uh, your release date, or was it concealed for security purposes? You had to go to immigration camp and all that stuff. Yeah, take, can you take us through all that? So they had. Um, we had to go to court. Um, it, was, it was. It was funny because your point about losing two stone and what have you. So the three of us hadn't seen each other for a few months now. We went inside in April, May, and it was now November. And um, we all got, we were all, we all ended up back at the MCC together for the first time, right? And uh, Mulgrew was a big, tall guy, right? He's a well-built bloke. And he'd lost so much weight and his, he, had a, he had a crew cut. And he just looked shockingly bad, right? And we walked into the prison cell and David, the other guy, Oh, yeah, Gary, nice, nice to see you. You look great. I said, no, he don't. He looks like shit. What do you say that for? He looks like rubbish. And he did look like rubbish, right? So we go into court. We have the hearing. We see our lawyers for the first time for a little while, which is lovely because we all were great friends with them. Nice to see them all. And um, then we weren't allowed to know the date back. Um, but the other two went before I did. And when it was my turn, two officers from Wandsworth turned up. Then this guy he comes into the prison wing in, in the MCC. Uh, Mr. Darby, I, I, get your stuff. We're going in half an hour. I'm like, I ain't got any stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? I'm in prison. I got nothing. I just got a book or something. That's it. <laughs> yeah, so I can come now. He goes, well, no, we can't go for half an hour. Said, okay, right, right. So then we were blue lighted all the way through Manhattan to the JFK. And, you know, it's, you know um, I've got four. I had... Um, police car in front, police car behind, four officers in, with me, about 12 police officers escorted me, a dangerous felon, to the JFK. Right? <laughs> Fast blue light all the way. And we, we went onto the tarmac at JFK. Didn't even go through any customs, nothing, just went straight on the tarmac. Got put on the plane. Mm. Because it's Thanksgiving, right? So we get put on this plane. <laughs> the air stewardess comes down to the back of the plane. The two coppers are either side. And uh, she says to the copper, um, would you like a drink? And, and uh, he goes, yes, please. I'll just have a Coke. 
and she says, yeah, would you like a drink? And she goes, yeah, I'd get a Coke. And she goes to him, what does he want, right? Please I'm, tell me you said a roast. <laughs> no, I didn't say anything. I just, he goes, what does he want? And and uh, the copper goes, oh, what do you want? I said, well, am I allowed? Can I get a beer? He said, no, you know you can't. I said, all right, well, water? He said, yeah, I have water if you want. Okay. So off she goes, she goes away. She comes back and uh, she says to the copper, right, what would you like to eat? It's Thanksgiving, we've got roast turkey, right? Like this, right? And the copper goes, oh, that'd be nice. I'll have roast turkey, right? And he says, what would you like? I'd roast turkey. And she goes, what does he want, right? And, and the copper went, he speaks. <laughs> and she said to me, what do you want? I said, I'm English as well. Like that. She went, okay. I said, I'll have roast turkey. Best meal I've had for six months. Be lovely, right? <laughs> But it was when she said what when she said he speaks it was like fucking really are you just treated like complete second class trash right that's the opposite of what i had so the guard he's like we're going to put you Did on the you plane get repatriated then no oh, I, you just, were deported, I just got deported right? oh, so right. the guard goes i'm going to put you on the plane first so you don't scare the passengers and all the way down you know he's talking to me like i'm just a number but then this Cockney cabin crew come down the stairs and talk to me like I was a human being. They were so nice. And to hear someone, to, after six years, talk to me like I was a normal person. I was like, ah. Oh. So you, <laughs> didn't, you didn't get repatriated to serve time. You got... No, I didn't do a, a transfer. I just did all my time in Arizona. Did you? Why didn't you? Because I fought my case for 26 months. You cannot start the process until you are sentenced. And then it takes another two years of going through the bureaucracy to even get the deportation by which time I would have been all, almost out. God, but so you never got the luxury of serving time over here then. But my mate, who I just lived with for 10 years, DJ Mike Hot Wheels, who was one of my ecstasy suppliers out of LA, he was in the feds and he ended up in Wandsworth. M miserable place. Miserable, yeah. miserable place. Horrible place, actually. Really horrible. The worst one was Lay Hill, though. I ended up in Lay Hill. And that, that was even worse because Lay Hill was notorious for all the sex offenders in, in Lay Hill. Was that Lay Hill? It's it Gloucester. Oh, Gloucester? Yeah, yeah. I ended up back there with my family in Bath. Gotcha. So um, I ended up in Gloucester. And that was, honestly, Sean, of all the times... Look, Lay, um, Allenwood was, was horrible, but livable right because of the people i was surrounded funny stories yeah. the mob guys they tell you all day long you sit with them and they tell you about so the time i did this or the time i did that and you'd be laughing and be like, oh that's you know you could do a movie off every one of them yeah, yeah absolutely so absolutely yeah. how long yeah. were you in lay hill for no i ended up in lay hill for about six months and it was mm. uh, it was just a miserable experience a miserable experience right and um there was a handful of non-sex offenders in there that were there because their families were like in Devon or Exeter or Plymouth or what have you. And so they asked to be based there. And so I ended up on a wing, on a lifer wing, because it was for older prisoners, but it was lifers. And there was, um, out of 20 of us, there's only three of us that were not murderers, rapists, or sex offenders of some sort. Only three of us, right? And it was the, it was the most, horrible existence because you're surrounded by all these really awful people so just as an example um i went to get some toast one saturday when i just got in the unit i went to get some toast downstairs from there's a little kitchen out where you get a cup of tea and some toast walk down and as i'm walking into the into the kitchen there's a little guy coming out with glasses little bold guy comes out he's got a plate of toast and a cup of tea so he can't i open the door for him right so i'm like he goes oh thank you like that open the door and I walk into the little unit and the other two lads are sitting there going, Darby, what, 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 are you, what are you doing? I'm, what do you mean? He goes, sit down, come here. I'm going to tell you the facts of life. Like, right, what, what? He goes, do you know who that was? You opened the door for? I'm like, how, how do I know? I've got no idea. I just got here. I don't know. He goes, that guy, that guy was raping his daughter, right? And the, and the daughter went to tell the mother and as he was, she was telling the mother, he got hold of the wife, he killed the wife, killed the daughter, cut off both their heads, put the heads in a deep freeze and buried the bodies in the forest. That's who you don't just open the door for. Wow. And you're like, wow. God, that's mad. Mm. That's like, God, that's really, um, that's difficult, right? Yeah. And he said, and before you 
speak to anybody, I'm telling you now, in this unit, we are, you and us two are the only guys in here that haven't done, committed a really, really bad crime, right? And that's, you need to know that stuff, right? And so I ended up pretty much living a solitary existence in there. I don't believe I you. just didn't want anything to do with any of these people. It was just miserable, miserable. So did you read a lot then? Hmm. Yeah, Papillon was my favourite Oh, story. my God. Did you read it? I love Papillon. Isn't it great? Going on the island with the lepers and hiding out and on the run. And, oh, it's classic, isn't it's it? It's brilliant. And it, when you watch the, yeah. the film, which is the, well, the Dustin Hoffman, Steve McQueen film, just bloody yeah. brilliant, right? Yeah, the, the, yeah. The, I mean, but can you imagine getting put on an island like that? I mean, given where, you, I mean, what you went through, I mean, what I went through is bad enough, but you went through something even worse. But that, been, being put on an island like, like that. Yeah, it's no joke. Yeah. And, and then stuck in solitary for like two years or something. Yeah. If you've never read it, I, no. if any of you lot have never read it, I'm telling you, Papillon, you what Papillon, a... Papillon, James? What you've a read it, you have read it. What a great book. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I read that one, the follow-up as well. Yeah, yeah great, yeah. great stuff. I remember watching a movie with my dad when I was a kid, Dustin Hoffman. Yeah, yeah. So I read that, lots of books, mate. I have friends would send me books and send me things from the outside. And Did you read Shantaram? My wife has got Shantaram, and oh, I've not goodness. read it, but she oh. swears by it. What a fabulous book. If, if Papillon might be the best book ever written by someone who's in prison, or Shantaram, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, it's close. It's close. Some of the scenes he describes, like when he's robbing the bank and, um, <laughs> and when he's escaping from prison and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He drove the car. <laughs> <laughs> I, so we were, when we were on bond, we were um, out in the prison. So we, we ended up in the, it's the Richmond Arms having a few beers one day. And there's we, this lad's there. He's got an England shirt on, starts chatting to us. And it, it turns out he's on the run, right? He said, What are you over here for? I'm on the run. Are you? What for? We're doing what? Oh, well, I got, a, I got a book of 50 checks. This is back in the day when we had checkbooks and stuff. And I fraudulently issued 50 checks, right? Yeah, for how much? He goes, oh, about four grand. Oh, right, four grand. That's not bad, is it? That's pretty good. He goes, what are you not here for? Well, um, well, we robbed a bank, right? <laughs> you robbed a bank? How much? Oh, 7.3 million. <laughs> Fucking seven. Uh, anyway, we ended up having a few beers with this guy all day long, right? As day goes by, he gets to about six o'clock, like we were on it all day long, and he wandered up and he says to me, Yeah, he says, um, you know, um, you said that it was seven point three million. I'm like, Yeah, he goes, Any chance you give me the point three? What sweet talking about? So what was your actual day of release like? Oh, well, the thing of course is you get over here, Sean, it's a gradual process. Mm. So about four months from your probation date, you start to get day release. You get, so you get a day release and then you get um, weekend release and you get blocks of time out. So it's not like it all just comes as a, in a one go, but it happens very gradually. Um, but obviously it was, it was wonderful. Obviously, it was, well, even actually the first day out, the first day when I got a day release was wonderful amazing just the whole just the the getting out of the miserable existence that you get used to and jen it is miserable miserable right don't i've said this to journalists several times now don't all you people like in the sun and the mail and you're like oh being in prison is a bloody piece of cake absolutely not absolutely not it's the last thing it is it's horrible and if anybody thinks going to prison is a good thing, or you can have a good time, you're not. It's it's miserable, miserable. Did you say that your family members were visiting you at Lay Hill? How did that feel? Um, again, it was, it was it was difficult. You know, I mean, I mean, the thing about it is, you go into the visiting room, right, yes. and the exit is a little door like that in the corner, and at the end of the visit, you've had a maybe an hour, an hour and a half or what have you, and you're allowed to touch each other. And in the States, you can't touch each yeah. other, right? At the end, if you're in minimum or medium security, at the end, you can have a hug and they tell you, like, if you're going to give your girlfriend a goodbye kiss, kiss her like you're kissing your mom. <laughs> That's what they say. <laughs> yeah, right, so we could, you know, we had none of that. We couldn't, couldn't do any of that. But in, the, in Lay Hill, you were allowed to hug your kids oh, right. and what have you. You okay, could do that at cool. the end, only at the end. Yeah. And then they would go out 
Would they get upset or? Well, by then, of course, Jen, what was happening by then? You have to remember in our case, it started in 2001. We were extradited in 2006. Yeah. Went to prison in 2008. Now it's 2010. So we've had 10 years of this, right? Yeah. And, and my daughters, their attitude to it was that it's near the end, Dad, right? We're, this is nearly over. That's good. So... Yeah, every time they came to see me, it was, it was a step nearer. But it was all the answer to your question is that when they go out through that door and you have to go back to your cell, it just is devastating. It is de after I had the first visit when I was in, um, I had a friend come to see me in, um, in Allenwood. I, I went back to the my, I went and got in the shower actually, I just wept. <sighs> For about twenty minutes, just it was so just difficult, so emotional, whole thing. You know, you sort of, yeah. You know, in, in my case, you stitched up. You didn't do it. You stitched up. You, you're there for political reasons. It, the whole thing is completely unfair, and um, I just on that occasion, it was all just too much. But you know, you look. I mean, you've come through some stuff. Bloody hell, re, re, knowing your story a little bit. You must be incredibly resilient and strong mentally. Mm. Well, that's what the therapist said. He said, after dealing with the thugs in here, you'll have a skill set that will last you for the rest of your life. So there are some positives going to come from this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'd rather they didn't. You'd rather you didn't sort of get them that way. But oh, yeah, you've got some positives. Yeah. And you also, Sean, have got a bank of stories that you can tell Definitely. in the pub for the rest of your life, right? Yeah. Like funny things that have happened. Yes. This guy, uh, these guys, <laughs> this is funny as opposed to bad. So I'm in the in Allenwood in the bathroom, and this black guy comes up. He goes, "Hey, I've heard about you. You're." Uh, you're from in you're from Australia, right? And I'm like, no, mate, I'm from England. He goes, yeah, but England's near Australia, isn't it? <laughs> and I went about ten thousand miles. He goes, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> I had prisoners and guards ask me what language do they speak in England? <laughs> no. Oh no, yes, yeah, absolutely. What language are you speak in? Uh, English. <laughs> It's not French. Hey, oh, it's American. Yeah, it's American. No, it's not American. It's English. So, seriously. You guys bastardized our language. Yeah, that's it. And, and stole our women's games, like rounders that you call baseball. And what's the other one? Netball. Basketball. That didn't go down too well. Good <laughs> <laughs> old games, you say? No, so, so funny. I mean, oh, I don't know, Sean. It's great. Great stories. I mean, I my wife says to me now, because I don't have any anger about it anymore. And I we, we laugh about a little bit about the whole thing. And he sort of look back and he says, you know, in a funny kind of way, he, I think you enjoyed the experience. Don't you? I said, well, I enjoyed being in Texas brilliantly. And I enjoyed some of the people I met inside. I mean, bloody hell, who can say they met a mob boss and, mm. and had a decent chat with him, right? Because in a way, you do miss that, don't you? Because the mafia guys I spoke to, I, like, I miss having those conversations. Kind well, of. they were funny guys, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, the one I, th th this is probably complete load of rubbish, but it was a great story to tell. So, um, the the one who um, <laughs> who popped his his pal and um, his wife had got gone with his living his friend. He introduced me to quite a few mob guys. Right, he'd be walking over the chow and he'd go, "Hey, Darby, this is so and so, so and so." There's this little old guy shuffling across the company was probably in his late 80s at that point and uh he says to him hey this is darby he's from england he goes you're from england man hey, you know robert maxwell i'm like well i don't know robert maxwell but i know who he is he goes that fucking that motherfucker we shot him up and threw him off his boat <laughs> and you're like going really <laughs> so hey, what do you mean why did you do that he goes oh i was a hitman i was a hitman for the mob right you go well, seriously now oh, i have no idea if that's right or wrong or what a nonsense yeah. i have no clue but he didn't need to come out with that i don't know <laughs> who knows what happened to him that so no idea yeah wow so the day you got released what was the first thing you did well, that's it. We'd be telling, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it was a very nice day out. Let me put it that way. <laughs> now we we went. Um, uh, my son actually on the day of release, um, my son-in-law picked me up, and uh, I had to get I had to get the Weymouth to report for probation, believe it or not. And then 
went went to stay at my mum's for a little while and then set about rebuilding my life. Mm. And so I was very fortunate. I met an amazing, very nice lady who's now my wife. And uh, I've been, I had the support of lots of friends, Sean, lots of friends and family. And over the period, I've been able to rebuild my life. And I now have a very, very, very nice, enjoyable life and do lots of lovely Fulfilled. things. And yeah, lovely, yeah. Jen. Yeah. How very did you, lucky. How did your mum handle it over the years? She's been amazing. Um, Obviously, she worried. She was. Um, she's now in her early eighties. Um, she's been wonderful. She's, I've got two brothers. She's been brilliant for all of us, mate. To be fair, I mean, it's, look, you know, your parents are the same for you, right? I mean, they just stand by you, don't they? Yeah, yeah, I, they awesome, just do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, you know, I mean, in your case, it, I, your you listen to your story. It's actually quite an amusing story, right? How you went from you know making a lot of money, and then you you sort of oh, find an even better way to make even more money, and you see so it's quite an amusing thing to do, right? <laughs> I, I realise that you know selling drugs ain't you know isn't exa yeah. I mean, isn't exactly the number one thing to do in the world, but it's actually quite an amusing story. And so when you're inside, it's kind of a you know in terms of the the level of crimes. It's kind of not a bad crime. So you kind of go, well, family's su supportive because, uh, I mean, clearly there are levels where you, where you are not going to support people, but we've, I've had great support. I've had, I mean, the interesting thing is that lots of people we work with, lots of friends, they all know the story, right? They know what happened, right? They know what, what that we, we're on a hiding to nothing. They know that. And so they've been... Uh, brilliant with me over the years i've been i'm incredibly lucky good did prisoners abroad help you over the years i'll send you any newspapers or books or anything no no oh, that's a shame so when did you decide to write your book or what made you um so when i was inside i i, I was so amused by some of the stories the different people that i met they're all you could, all day long you'd tell you these daft things they did <laughs> and I just would write letters back home. Mm. So I'd write letters to uh, my ex-wife and my mum and my kids. And uh, then she, my mum photocopied them and sent them to other friends and and emailed them. And when I came out, the people said, oh, those letters are great. God, you need to publish a book. But I didn't want to. I, 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 I didn't want to go back and do it all again. I was like, no, I'm not doing that. The other two both wrote books, to be fair, with varying degrees of success. I think I read Gang of One. Gary's, yeah. Where he's dealing with the Texas Aryan Brotherhood, is he? Yeah. He, and it, there's a problem right away in his book. What's a funny, beginning. yeah, Gary's a yeah. great storyteller. Yeah. Where's Gary based now? He's in Italy. He's in uh, just outside Florence. Does he ever come back to the UK? Yeah. Love to get him in the yeah, studio. Yeah, he's then. funny. He's that's, a good guy, Gary. Yeah. Tells great stories. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. Funny, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I message him. Um, I, he, he and I got some businesses together, so mm. no problem. Um, but the other varying degrees of success, their books. And um, I was just in a, I was in a pub with my brother one day, and his best friend was there, and his best friend was telling me that his son George Harrison had had a book published. So I just casually went, "No, oh, I've got a book," and he's like, "Have you?" I said, "Yeah, but I'm not writing it." He said. Um, well, what's your book? I said, well, I've got all these letters. When I was inside, all the stories and all the different people yeah. that we met and different things that happened. He said, oh, George would be really interested in doing that. I said, okay, well, I'll give you some copies of my letters. And if he's interested, tell him to call me. And he was, and he is, and I never believed it would get written and done. And uh, and it did, and it got the, the whole COVID thing uh, messed up a little bit, to be fair. Mm. Um because the book publisher then he decided to sell the quiller publishing, but he they sold to another company, and it, it it's been a bit of a roller coaster. But it's out there and it's had really nice reviews. Um, and the funniest thing was Ellie put it on her Instagram and it went to number one on Amazon for a day. Oh my goodness! Yeah, but because of that, because <laughs> Ellie's it was on Ellie's. Um, Number one in memoirs and um, biographies. Wow. Nice one, Ellie. Yeah, that's the power of social media, Sean. 600,000 so, subs, I saw you got. Well it. done. <laughs> I mean, Instagram followers. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, so that was fun. Doing that was fun. So, no, it's been nice to do it. Yeah. And has that opened any doors, the book? No. 
being on here. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're um, well. Coming on here is nice to meet you guys. It's, never, it's very pleasant. Thank you. Um, Always a pleasure. Same but um, no, I've got a very successful uh, pub business now. A pub business. Pub business. Tell yeah. me more. Um, <laughs> they're, they're, they're all down in South Wales and uh, oh, called Red Dragon Pub Company. And uh, we've got 17 sites. Fantastic. Oh, wow. It is good. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's great fun. We've got very nice people, lots of nice people around us, and mm. we have a lot of fun with it. Yeah. yeah. It's good. What's the most important life lessons then you take from all this? <sighs> right. <laughs> my uh, When my wife gets annoyed about, you know, um, put the toilet seat down or haven't what, brushed your feet coming in the house or something i'm like look the little things the little things the big things are are you healthy are you happy are you enjoying what you're doing because it's such a truism right every single day you've got to live every single day enjoy every single day mm. because you never quite know what's going to happen to you i 100 percent did not expect to wake up seven o'clock that morning and find I was facing 35 years I didn't expect it I thought my life was finished and so the, my big thing now is just to enjoy everything you're doing if, if, if it's if what you're doing is hard work don't do it or if it's painful don't do it there's no need you don't need to just li enjoy right I saw your thing you said about I'm not interested in plasma screen tvs or this or that or uh, i'm interested in enjoying myself and i think that that's and and, and love everybody i have a huge family now jen right? i have uh, there's 26 of us in my in my family right <laughs> so my kids my grandchildren their partners and that's that is the most important thing to me all of them having fun with them seeing them going out with them you know i look my grandson came to football with me last week for the first time ever. It was just the best. It was just brilliant. Um, Bristol City, they're not very good, but they're decent. <laughs> and uh, we were coming home. We went to Reading and uh, he's seven. And he just said to me, he said, that's just the best night in my life. And it meant the world. It meant the world to me. Things like that. I had a mafia friend called Two Tonys and he really rammed that into me. His favourite book was A Day in the Life of Ivan Donosovich. Right. And he's like, when people were complaining about things, he was like, where Ivan was at, they're fighting over a fish eyeball in the soup just to try and stay alive. You guys are complaining the food's too cold. Recreation didn't start on time. These guys are fighting over a fish eyeball in the soup. And then you just like put everything into perspective. Don't yes, you? mate. Mm. And the other one I get to think about is it, it, my internet's not working. It takes oh, it takes yeah. two minutes to connect. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, like, give me a break, right? <laughs> so yeah, I'm with you. I'm completely with you on that. I, yeah. yeah, yeah. Love your life and love all your friends and all your people all around you. That's the thing. We, we, Definitely. We like to end on a note of love. Giles, is there anything you would like to say to the viewers? That camera's right on you. The people who have sat with us for two and a half hours and watched this. Two, is it two and a half hours? Yeah. Well, if you're still watching, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. It's been uh, it's been a real pleasure. It's been lovely talking to you both. Thank you very much it's been for having an absolute me. Absolute pleasure. Lovely. So. All right. And for people out there who are watching, then Giles, um, where can they get your book? Can they follow you on social media? Um, I'm not a big social media fan, but my book's on Amazon. Okay. You can buy it in, from Amazon. Um, it's got lots of nice reviews. They only had one bad review. What was it called? It's called Inside Allenwood. And it's all about um, different people I met when when we were uh, enjoying my time at the, at, the, at the US federal correctional system. But if you do want to support the family, you can go over and down and watch the video of his daughter's interviewing him and subscribe to Jessica Carter. There you go. She's doing really well on YouTube. She is. She is. <laughs> she is. What's up? Yeah, what's up, man? Yeah. So please let us know in the comments what you thought about today's interview. Huge thank you to Giles for coming out and um, regaling us and entertaining us with his stories today. Had many flashbacks throughout the last two and a half hours because of the similarity of certain experiences. So huge thank you um, to all the new subscribers. And huge thank you to Jen for coming in and co-hosting. And stay tuned. You can watch her trailer now. 
and her links and Giles's links are down there in the description box below the video. Jen's also on Insta with her organic cotton clothing business. And we're going to have lunch now and go on yeah. to film with Sarah Jane Baker. And huge thank you to Joe and James for coming out, filming and audio. And their links are also in the description box. So until next time, thank you for tuning in. Take care. Cheers. Is right. is the Arizona prison handshake. It's this, this, and then bump. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Go, yeah. I'll just give you a hug. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you, Jen. It's lovely. Lovely to meet you. Right. Here at Boomer and Jen, we offer a wide range of organic or recycled clothing. We all know our planet is important. We only have this one. So it's vital that we all work together to slow down and reverse the changes to the environment. Whilst we all know that big industry are having a significant effect on pollution, here at Boomer and Jen, we believe that if we all make small changes, we can do our part. Fast fashion causes detrimental effects to the planet. Not only is nearly 20% of global wastewater produced by the fast fashion industry, but there is a considerable amount of fast fashion ending up in landfill. So let's move away from fast fashion items that are only worn once or twice and start wearing extremely comfortable, durable and environmentally friendly clothing and ethical jewellery. Boomer and Jen was founded in a quiet town in Devon in 2018. It has now gone from strength to strength as the world is becoming more aware of the current climate situation, helping our customers to buy sustainable, quality clothing. All of our products are fair trade and registered with the Global Organic Textiles Standard Association. Check us out on organic cotton clothing dot co dot uk